maybe on one for the rest of the meeting. Oh, it's very light. Yeah, but just so then it doesn't block your line of sight or anybody else's. Do you think that's too much? <laughs> um, Mayor, we can see what it looks like. I can help you move it. And then in the um, interim, I'll put it in council. All right, we're back in business. If everybody could take their seat. Seats. And if we could get council to come. Did the, the, the sign jump up? Something keeps, yeah. Say that. Once you get down into like the director level software, like, who did you know that got <laughs> All right, we're going to call this meeting back to order. And the first thing that we're going to, or what we're going to begin with, is going to be an update from Burke Brown for DEI. He's next. Plug on in. Uh, yeah, no, don't worry. Thumb drive, no, no worries. You know, I mean, seriously, right? I make, I had one job. <laughs> I'll just face it this way. <laughs> oh, yeah? Is it HDMI? Because I do have a port. Trying to take too much time. Oh yeah, that's. What is that? What do you, would you look at that? There we go. And then I just need to switch you over. Okay, thank you. How's everybody doing? It's good to see everyone. Look at us making that work. Okay. So just wanted to provide an update on what's going on in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. <clears throat> and so as this, as this rolls up, ultimately we've, we finished the first phase of uh, the work, the foundational work that we've been doing uh, for the uh, city of Eureka that through the HR department, which has really kind of set this in motion over four years ago. And the great news is that we've created that foundation where we got clear on what are the values, what's the culture that we want to create, what's the vision that we want to create. And so as we've done that and that foundation has been created, it's now we're in a place of maintenance. How do we maintain it? How do we have this go deeper into the fabric of the community, deeper into the fabric of everybody that is working for the city staff and working for the city and serving the city as a whole? Uh, we established the core elements. There we go. Nope, well, not yet. The problem is when we restart it. We're fine. <laughs> We're fine. <laughs> the, the subtle side. <laughs> I appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Uh, but I'll just talk through it for right now um, as the reset occurs. <laughs> All right. When it comes up, it will come up. But establishing core elements. Uh, has been done and now we're at a place where we're exploring kind of leadership opportunities. So it's not something where a third party is only the one that's engaged in this effort. It's how do we expand it beyond that space? How do we engage beyond that? Oh, the magic button. <laughs> we'll let it, I'll just blather on. <laughs> how are you enjoying your stay up here? <laughs> it's, been, it's been marvelous. I always love coming up here. I really, really, really do. Uh, so what I just came up here for initially was for procedural justice and implicit bias. We just had the conversation. It was a packed house uh, at the Warfinger, which was amazing. Uh, and being able to just have that conversation. We've already done procedural justice and implicit bias, and then being able to have it again with more new employees that have come in and be able to have that conversation and say, this is who we are. 
three years ago, four years ago, we decided that this is our vision. These are the values. This is how we want inclusion and belonging to be so, uh, shown and seen within who we are as individuals and as a city. And then being able to teach it again. And what was so wonderful is everybody, there was the receptivity, as Will was known, he was there. It was, it was great today. And you can see that people are really connected and truly wanting to see, okay, yes, I want to create a city that is more inclusive, that has a, more of a sense of belonging where we're listening to the voices of individuals, but at the same time, they see where it's beneficial for, towards themselves. Because at the end of the day, the individual growing creates the communal growing. And that's something that I'm really excited to see having continue. Uh, in the same way, we're trying to get to a place where it's no longer going to be just, as I said, third party that is doing this training. We want to train trainers to be able to step up and facilitate. So we have the equity consortium that has come up. We have leaders within the department heads that are engaging in ways. We're actually going to have a meeting tomorrow to see on what movements have been made and what we want to uh, be able to make shifts on in terms of improving and spreading that DEI culture that we want to spread. So excited about that. And there's a It's not showing? Yeah, your screen is not showing. Okay, no worries. That's fine. I'll send this, I'll, thank you for trying everybody. Round of applause. <laughs> no, I, I, there you go. Uh, so the Equity, Equity Consortium, what we're doing is we're collab, they're, work, they're working together to collaborate and create more ways where it's not just happening within the city staff, but it's also working within the community as a whole. Uh, HR has been doing an incredible job. The Juneteenth celebration is gonna be coming up and they're preparing a space for that to occur. Pride Month activities have been put together, and then also inclusive leadership training, which is partnering with the county through Humboldt Equity Consortium to create community leaders and invite leaders uh, throughout the community to promote diversity and leadership. The goal is to maintain momentum at this place. Yes, we've done the beginning work, but the goal is to keep it going, make it a part and embed it into the fabric of every single individual that works here, and then also the community as a whole. Continuing progress, we're gonna be doing more education and then at the same time, something that I really want to implement is informal discussions. Because after the talk occurs, what discussions are happening? Is everybody engaging? Yes, we talked about the commitments we want to make, but we want follow-up to make sure that those commitments are being enacted, right? Where that accountability shows up. And all that we're holding ourselves accountable to is the vision that we claimed. And what we were talking about today in procedural justice is that if these are our values, if we're not living by them, then there's a cognitive dissonance. And we have the freedom to be able to communicate with each other to say, hey, this is who we say we are. This is how we want to show up. And seeing everybody on board has been extremely, extremely uh, encouraging. So it's a shared responsibility, and we're all working together, really happy about what's going to be coming in the next few months, uh, the education that's happening, the training of the trainers, and then empowering other leaders, even throughout the departments, to be able to step up and facilitate some of these discussions. Because the more that it's happening, the more that, the more that I get to step back, the more that this third party that's out and it comes in from the inside, that's really when you know that it's grafted to the culture. And uh, I've seen such incredible thing. The past four years, as everybody knows, I've been able to communicate and chat with everybody here and some of the people here. Um, I'm so grateful for it. It's so real. And the thing that is most important for me and what I enjoy the most is the receptivity. The fact that everybody really wants to, there's a quote that says, if better is possible, good is not enough. And seeing that that effort is being made and that people are really showing up and the fact that I'm here again really shows that it is something that's important. So wanted to give and provide that update. Thank you so much for letting me speak with you. And I'll leave this laptop alone. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you much. Very and back along the lines of our future is so bright. I would like to invite Noel Bragg up to give his Martin Luther King's Day presentation. Thank you so much for being here. We hope you won your game last meeting. Hi, everyone. I'm Noel. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to the city of Eureka for this opportunity, and of course, everybody for coming. The theme for the speech today is it starts with me, the urgency of creating a beloved community. The King Center describes beloved community as a place where all conflicts are resolved peacefully and a place where we work together as a community to make sure everyone has everything they need. Dr. King once said the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of, beloved, of the beloved community so that when the battle's over, a new relationship becomes, comes between the oppressed and the oppressor. Dr. King understood that zero conflict is an unattainable goal. Conflict is human nature. It's how we resolve those conflicts that we can change. 
He felt that world nonviolence was key to a peaceful world and nonviolence should be used to solve all conflicts. To me, beloved community is a place or a group of people, no matter how big or small, where people are free and all problems are solved with nonviolence. To me, a beloved community is a place where everyone has everything they need and everyone is equal. I believe that the beloved community isn't just a goal. It's a series of goals that we need to take steps towards. In order to obtain the beloved community, we have to eliminate the triple evils, militarism, poverty, and racism. These are the three things that are holding us back from the beloved community. In order to start building a beloved community here in Humboldt, we need to eliminate the triple evil. That could mean helping people getting housing and getting back on their feet. It could also mean supporting local community groups like NAACP, Black Humble, HC Bama, B Black, Central Day Pueblo, Hawaiian Asian Pacific Islander, or any of the hundreds of local community organizations supporting our community. More importantly, it would mean teaching our young ones about nonviolence by modeling and practicing alternative ways to express anger in front of your children. Never forget, we are always watching and learning from what we see adults do around us. Supporting youth and children to be effective leaders at the youngest age possible is crucial for cultivating our beloved community. You, can, you can't learn to lead if you don't practice it, and yet to be good at it, you have to be practiced a lot. Allow children to start learning by providing them with opportunities to lead, talking, leading their kindergarten class. You can support your kid to be a leader in so many ways. You can help them take control of their life and taking responsibilities for decisions. If we do this, I believe that Humble will become a community of leaders. Like I said, the theme of this speech is it starts with me, the urgency of creating a beloved community. If you'd like to aid in creating a beloved community, there are so many things you can do. As a child, it's easy to feel like you can't do anything. It's easy to feel powerless. Something anyone can do is practice ways of peacefully resolving conflicts. By practicing nonviolence, you are already helping to be, to build a beloved, a beloved community. It starts with you. If you wait for someone to start something, then it will never happen. You have to take action. Own your leadership and begin acting. Begin small, but begin. It doesn't matter how small the steps, or it doesn't matter how small the steps, or what matters is you're doing something and sticking to it. My dad says that one's time, attention, effort, and presence are more valuable than money. You don't, you don't have to have money or power. You just need commitment and willingness to work together. In which case, all we need is an enduring commitment and the rest will work itself out. Let's come together and commit to building our beloved community now. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. I think many of us should read that every day. <laughs> As a reminder, we can make a difference. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I just have a couple of mayor's announcements. Um, I'm still recovering, so I've been kind of laying low. Um, but I was grateful that I got to spend, I guess this is a youth meeting, really, because I got to spend um, the afternoon with City Manager Slattery. We met with the high school students from Eureka High, with Miguel Guerrero and the planning department and Mr. Parker from Eureka High uh, for the neighborhood naming project. And it was really exciting to hear these kids and to watch them come together to, to, uh, and do surveys and to figure out names for the neighborhoods. And I just have to say that some of them are pretty funny. Uh, one of them, let's see, I told them I was going to read this. This was Caleb's, the uh, getting high on the west side. Was one <laughs> um, Sequoia District, Chinatown, Pat's Place, Cement Street. Anyway, the opportunity for our youth to be involved in our city, I think, is really incredible, and I really appreciate it. And I hope that we can continue this partnership so that our kids can grow up and we can, again, have the brighter future that we all deserve. So I really, again, Noel, you just blew my mind today. Thank you so much. And so with that, we will go to. Um, public comment. Oh, no, I wanted to say one more thing. I got to go to Lemonade Day 2 uh, with Mayor, past Mayor Susan Seaman, and it was a really great time. We went to lots of different stands. I drank seven glasses of lemonade <laughs> and had a lemon 
um, Rice Krispie treat, so I wasn't feeling too good <laughs> later in the afternoon. But you know, it was great for the to be out with the kids and to support them in, in what they're doing because again, our future is so bright. It's just so bright, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of that. So now we will move on to public comment. This is the time for members of the public who wish to be heard on matters that do not appear on the agenda. City Council policy is to limit each speaker to three minutes. Such time allotment or portion thereof shall not be transferred to other speakers. The public will be allowed to speak concurrently with the calling of an agenda item following the staff presentation of that item. And pursuant to the Brown Act, the City Council may not take action on an item that does not appear on the agenda. And is anyone here for public comment? For items not on the agenda. Hello. I bet you're happy to see my smiling face once again after such a long absence. <clears throat> I wanted to start out, well, actually, before he leaves the room, I wanted to commend that young man for his ideals and for his optimism. He sounds just like me when I was around that age. And, uh, and I hope that um, when life smacks him in the face with reality that he deals with it better than I did because I became an awfully cynical old bastard, so I hope that doesn't happen to you. <laughs> Keep it up, Ben. Uh, um, <clears throat> beyond that, the Alzheimer's um, presentation, uh, I wanted to, I don't know if any of them are left in the room, but I wanted to say how much I appreciated what they do. My father died of Alzheimer's. It was um, not a pretty way to go. Um, there are probably some here in this room that wish I had it, <clears throat> but uh, um, unfortunately for you all, <clears throat> I'm still sharp as a tack. But uh, anyways, yeah, I, 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 I support what they do, and I appreciate it. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, that they knew that I'm not always just complaining about things. I really, really appreciate them. Um, beyond that, then we go on to, <clears throat> I noticed we no longer have a sergeant in arms in the room. <laughs> and um, I was wondering if that was because um, the threats that um, were made against me for my inappropriate and obscene speech and, and whatnot, derogatory terms, um, and, uh, and, the, and the reason that the art sergeant I was put in here. And then uh, in the last, you know, since then, um, we've had a council member and a mayor <clears throat> who have opened the door of the outhouse, so to speak, with asshole and oh shit, and, um, and basically made it to where I can speak freely the way I want to when I'm talking about the bullshit going on uh, in this town. Um, you know, on the way down here, I came down uh, I or I Street. Um, I've been up and down H and I Street. I don't know dozens of times since we uh, opened our beautiful new um, bicycle freeway. Uh, I, I actually saw a bicyclist this time. The first time, very first time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the the um, ungrateful cretin was uh, walking his bicycle on the sidewalk. He wasn't even using the beautiful lane that we made for him and I didn't see a flat tire so I guess it was his choice maybe there's too much traffic on H and I for a bicyclist to feel safe um and then beyond that we go on to you know um just uh, uh, just a lot of the lot of, you know the bullshit you know people say why don't I uh, um, say anything positive and um but the thing about it is is that many of us have come to you with positive um suggestions and they've been ignored continuously so once again, you know, it's like, I think you guys are on a bullshit agenda. You're dead set on it. You're not going to get break away from it. And, and that's, and, and we, what we say doesn't mean anything. So screw you all. Thank you. First off, good to be back here. Uh, I work for a doctor and our clients are mainly geriatric. We always joke in the office that uh, the average age of our clients is about 100. So I appreciate the awareness for forms of uh, degenerative brain diseases because uh, we work with that clientele. But I'm here to talk about other issues as usual. As an immigrant, a third generation Holocaust survivor whose mother was born here in exile, as a father of a daughter of mixed descent, I'm here to tell my fellow Americans that the time to be silent and timid is over. I call upon all caring, compassionate and conscious citizens to oppose the godless, ruthless and clueless agenda of those pathetic provincial amateurs up there to stand up and demand transparency, accountability and responsibility from their selected officials up on this pedestal. 
These incompetent, corrupt and self-serving criminals should be driven out of office, trialed and sentenced for their trans uh, transgressions. These fraggles, freaks and failures prey on the constant constraint and good-heartedness of us the people, butcher the golden goose for grant money and deprive us all of our God-given inalienable rights to freedom, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. It's time to take off the blinders, the muzzle, and the gloves and recall these unapologetic ideologues that want to subvert our children, poison their bodies, minds, and souls, and line their pockets in the process. This council and the mayor should be recalled, and some of them would really look good in orange jumpsuits. Silencing individuals, dehumanizing critics, critics aligning themselves with every and any scumbag that blows into town to have their ways with us, those inept, dim-witted, uneducated clowns need to go. From Kim, oh shit, uh, Bergel over Leslie Castellanin to G. Bakunin Fernandez and Katie Asshole Moulton, those people have proven to support every evil agenda from drug-peddling needle distributors to, the, to a God-mocking pile of perverts known as the sisters of perpetual perversions. No one wants your windmills, no one wants your frankenfish, your vaccine mandates, your hydrogen buses, and Scooter Bauer, by the way, can shove the exhaust pipe of his three-quarter ton diesel right up his rumpus. Make Eureka safe again, recall the council, trial the mayor, and get all those scumbags, their minions and Renfields, out of town. Tar and feather them politically. Show them that Miss Liberty doesn't need them, but we need Miss Liberty. In Jesus' name, amen. So we don't clap during public comment, um, and it's only because we want people to feel comfortable uh, when they share. So thank you for being here. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak? Oh, come on up. Thank you. <laughs> hey. Hi. Hi. And now for something different than that. Um, I'm April Nikolai, Director of Redwood Pride, and just wanted to quick plug our event this weekend, the 7th Annual Redwood Pride Summer Festival, where we'll have vendors and tablers at Jefferson from noon to four, which is various people, <laughs> which is various, various people from throughout the community, as well as various health organizations. And then after that, we'll have an all ages show also at Jefferson from five to seven. And then after that, we'll have a evening show at Synapsis, which is 18 plus from nine to 12. But now that that's done, I'm also here to make a comment on to Redwood Pride stance on the whole Palestine situation because we've So could you bring that forward actually during that item? Hmm? The Palestine, can you bring that forward during that item? Sorry, I had not looked at that. You're talking about the ceasefire Yeah, there's a ceasefire resolution ah. later on and so it's on the agenda. So would you be willing to comment at that time on that item? Yes. Thank you. I'll come back then. Okay, in appreciation. Are you talking about the ceasefire? I'm just speaking in general, actually. Oh, okay. Because Redwood Pride, as well as Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, Queer Humboldt, and Lost Coast Pride have been cited as be being silent during a lot of this stuff, but there's a reason that we have been, and because it's because we are nonprofits, and yes, that can affect why we can say one cannot say we are on one side or the other and this has been true as a threat to us really because only until recently there has been a bill that's been going through for somebody to be put into a position that if they're taking a stance on it they can revoke your nonprofit status and mm -hmm. Redwood Pride as well as Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are parts of larger organizations and we do not want to impact our parent organizations because there's also a lot of other people that that would impact as well. So that's part of the reason we've been remaining silent, but we've, sorry, also done so because we don't want to be being seen or dubbed anti-Semitic because clearly not, we support everybody. And sorry, just taking a moment. Basically, all the other organizations I mentioned share a very similar status. I've talked to them, spoken with them, and we're just trying to get a word out officially, publicly, that we are not 
taking any stance other than supporting a ceasefire. And that's all. Thank you, and thanks for clarifying that. I'm sorry that I interrupted you. Hello. Welcome. I've come to congratulate Lane Millar on his 5% pay increase for taking over the financials for Humboldt Bay Fire, a person with staff taking on more work who gets a pay increase. Let's contact that Eureka Police Department. There's a managerial staff of three. There should be four, but because of previous low pay, there aren't enough personnel to promote a fourth. The assistant chief's position remains vacant. The chief and two commanders have each taken a portion of the duties of that person. Additionally, that job is not an office hours job. Hostage situations, critical incidents, etc., require the presence of one of these three people in the cold, in the heat, at night, in the rain, and they have to be there until it is resolved, not until they've had enough. If it happens at the end of their already long day and drags on for hours, they're there. And when do you suppose the last time was they had less than a 50 to 60 hour work week, which they don't get overtime pay for? Or how about a real vacation? They didn't receive a pay bump for taking on any of that. In fact, in certain circumstances, some sergeants are earning more than their supervisors and no incentives are added for a commander's education, something officers and sergeants receive. Shame on you for allowing that to happen. I'm grateful beyond words for their loyalty. Maybe you should pay them what they're worth, a novel concept for first responders in this city. It isn't just the police department you underpay. Take five minutes and look at the documents online for surrounding cities and see what they pay their firefighters in benefits and perks and realize that the firefighters assigned in and around Eureka have a higher call incident rate and their pay is abysmal. I can't imagine they're impressed with Mr. Millar taking over their finances. In the financial advisory not meeting last week, he stated the city had a $15 million reserve and less than a minute later that became $11 million. Unless there are two different reserve accounts, that's a $4 million discrepancy. And let's not forget the $4.85 million that disappeared from Measure H oversight last year. I'm looking forward to the Measure H presentation. I'm interested to see where almost $12 million in income for that fund will be distributed, and I'm hoping the other category is capped at 8%, around a $1 million. Budget policy 2.68 should not be funded, as it was a brainchild of staff, not part of the ballot question, and is neither the spirit nor intent of Measure H. I remind you that, according to the city's website, Measure H continues to require community and fiscal accountability, including financial audits and an oversight from the Finance Advisory Committee to review Measure H funds to ensure they are spent responsibly on public priorities, and the public priorities listed are to maintain 9-11, fire, paramedic, and police emergency response and preparedness, repair potholes and maintain safe roads, support local business and jobs, maintain youth and senior services, support city and community health services, and continue homeless prevention programs. Let's spend the largesse the voters gave you responsibly as the voters gave it to you without added things. Thank you, Judy. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to share in public comment? Seeing none, do you see anybody on Zoom? Althea? Yep, hey there. Um, so I just wanted to uh, talk to you guys a little bit uh, about the new bike lanes. Um, I have talked to several bicyclists in the city who I know to be, you know, frequent, um, you know, long-time bicyclists, and they have all spoken absolutely glowingly about it. Um, they really like that the lane doesn't put them directly next to traffic. Um, they're really excited about that. Um, I'm uh, hopeful that, you know, with those crosstown bike lanes, maybe we'll be able to get the bike cops that people are always asking for. Um, now that the, the bike cops would hopefully be at less risk of injury, um, you know, doing their jobs. Um, you know, that kind of thing is one of the main reasons that um, I don't think the city has used them in a long time and uh, lots of cities don't use them is, is because it's considered too high risk for the police officers um, to do their jobs in these conditions. So um, again, hopefully, hopefully those lanes make that um, more likely here in Eureka. Um, 
yeah, just just wanted to um, speak out in support of that. And uh, also, I will concur that I know Eureka Fire Department Fire Department firefighters are underpaid, um, and that is one of the main issues with staffing. Um, so yeah, I would like to see more support for them. Um, you know, even if people don't necessarily want to pay more for them, they deserve to be paid more. Thank you. Thanks, Althea. Shannon? Shannon, your hands raised. Can there Oh, hi. Sorry. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you do. I know that it's a thankless job, and I know you don't make uh, any real money doing what you do, and you spend hours of your time dedicated to the community, and it is noticed. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Philip? Thank you. I just want to appreciate both council and staff for the steadfast uh, commitment to the 2040 general plan as evidenced by some of the um, changes we're seeing on H&I and other places around town. This is very heartening to see these things happening and um, I'm sure you're as excited as I. I was driving up past and through Arcata the other day and I saw all these buildings popping up where I hadn't been in a little bit and I got very excited for the future of Eureka and to see what kind of vibrant uh, community we can create with a bit of density and a bit more spaces for businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Do you see anyone else, Shannon? I see no one else. Okay, seeing no one else, we will close the public comment and move on to public hearings. So this public hearing is regarding the Earth Center CEQA and Disposition and Development Agreement with Janco and City Manager Slattery. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, unfortunately, tonight, um, our Director of Development Services, Kristen Kenyon, is um, not feeling well, but she is available here to um, answer the questions that I clearly couldn't answer. But um, anyway, so this is a, a agenda item related to the Earth Center. Um, just to give you some background on the Earth Center, um, I've been here for close to 18 years. We've been having discussions about this property uh, for at least the last seven to ten years, um, the initial discussions about this property surrounded um, Cal Poly and working with Servitas um, about seven or eight years ago. Um, their intention was looking at housing for um, professors and graduate students. Um, we had preliminary discussions uh, for probably about six or seven months. Nothing came of that. And then more recently, about four years ago, I'm guessing, somewhere around there, um, we were approached again by um, uh, Servitas, which was the company, third-party company that we were working with on those pre previous um, discussions. And they were working um, to look at basically a mixed-use development that would have been um, in combination with uh, Humboldt Transit Authority and the city. Um, we had discussions with them for approximately six months to a year. Um, out of that came an MOU that council adopted between um, uh, the city and Humble Transit Authority. Um, just to back up a little bit, the reason why Humble Transit Authority got involved was because they received a grant um, that would build a transit center and they came involved as this would have been a mixed-use development that would include housing some commercial space as well as a transit center so council adopted uh, approved an mou um, between us and humble transit authority um, we continued those design charrettes we were working with a architectural firm called the smith group um, and held I believe weekly or bi-weekly meetings for a long period of time to try and work out um, the agreement and work with Servitas. Um, eventually, we got to the point of coming to a um, 
an estimate for the project. Um, that estimate um, was out of the realm of some of the partners that we were with, with Cal Poly. Um, at that point in time, Cal Poly decided that they were still interested in the project, but that working with the third party was becoming too expensive. So at that time, we shifted and had discussions with Cal Poly, HTA, and the city. Continued those design meetings and trying to figure things out, come up with cost estimates, those type of things. Eventually, it led to there being a funding gap, and that funding gap <clears throat> was not able to be covered by Cal Poly. So we reached out to College of the Redwoods, had discussions with College of the Redwoods for um, a couple of months at least. They had received some funding from the state for student housing, spe spe specifically affordable student housing. Um, their grant dictated that that money be spent on campus. Um, they were having a hard time making that money accomplish what they were trying to achieve, and so they reached out to us and started to have discussions about making that happen. Um, in order for that to happen, it would have filled the funding gap and allowed for the overall project to come to fruition. However, um, they needed to reallocate the money and get approval from the state um, to to reallocate that money and use it off-site. Um, we had discussions with them. They aren't going to be able to get an answer for that until late summer, so um, staff um, decided to pivot, reached out to Danco to see whether or not they would be interested, and we've been having discussions with them and been working in conjunction with Danco, Humble Transit Authority, and the city to come up um, with a plan to move forward with the Earth Center. So... Um, that leads us to here today. Um, what we're looking to do is to um, adopt a resolution declaring the project exempt from CEQA. Um, the two exemptions that we're using, um, one is consistency with our general plan environmental impact report. Um, this project is very clearly consistent with the environmental impact report that we did for the general plan. And the other exemption is for a infill exemption, which is allowable by CEQA. Um, and then we have put together a disposition and development agreement. This is different than what the MOU was that we did with um, the previous rendition. Um, this is a disposition development agreement, very similar to the disposition and development agreement that council approved for the seventh and Myrtle property. Um, it's very similar to that. Um, the city um, does make money off the project. We get all 100% of the residual receipts um, from the project once it's up and running. Um, the DDA is currently in draft form, and um, we are asking, we're just being reviewed right now by Humble Transit Authority and Danco, and we're asking that you guys give me the authority to um, negotiate that disposition and development agreement and move it forward for this project. Um, we have gotten permission, I know there's a lot of concerns about the looks and the design of the project. Um, we've been, Danco and HTA, obviously HTA is very interested in this, very concerned as well and wanting to make sure that we're consistent with what we were moving forward with previously. Um, we did receive approval from Cal Poly who paid for all of the architectural, preliminary architectural work and the feasibility study and all the numbers associated with the previous project and they were, um, um, willing to give us all that information. That information has gone over to Danco. We're in discussions with Danco and um, HTA currently and setting up uh, weekly or bi-weekly meetings to discuss design and finalizing at least the conceptual designs. Um, and so we'll be moving forward with that. That will also have to go to design review as well. Um, we'll try you know, the intent will be trying to be consistent with what we were previously designing. And um, if council would like, we could come back and bring back, um, you know, once those conceptual designs, before we go to design review, we can bring it back for council's consideration and for their input as well. Um, currently, right now, the way that it's written so that we have flexibility is to, um, not limit the number of units. We can go up to 99 units. Right now, that's not what is being proposed, but there is a potential for that. Danco has expressed interest in doing similar to what we did before, is have mixed income levels in there. 
and so we didn't want to limit um, what could be done based on whatever comes out of the design process. Um, I think that's all I have, and if there's any questions, I'm available. City Attorney Luna's available, Director Kenyon's available, and then also we have Executive Director of uh, HTA, Greg Pratt, in the audience, as well as Chris Dart. I think he's the president of Danco here as well. Are there any questions? Renee? Or Council Member? Contreras Deloach. Um, can you help me understand uh, the process, why this didn't have to go out to everybody and have bidders on this again since what we had before fell out and now this is new? I'm, I'm trying to understand that. So there's a lot of allowances for this. We've had discussions throughout our this house, this current rendition of the housing element, as you're aware of, we have sole sourced other projects as well. We have sole sourced the rural communities project that's on um, Sunset Heights. That's a Pearson property. It's allowable in our measure, our implementation measure H34. It basically states in there that at any point in time, a developer can come out and reach out to the city and do that. Yes, there was. Um, Discussion in there about RFPs. It didn't limit us to that RFP. I think the reason why that was approved by the um, HCD, the Housing Community Development, was to ensure that we did develop these properties. But it's always allowed for an approval. There's also government code section that allows for sole sourcing properties as well. So, thank you. As long as they're for affordable housing, I should qualify that. Other questions? Council Member Castellano? Sure. Um, you know, last year we had some conversation around a parking garage on a property um, in close proximity to th the site that's selected for the Earth Center, you know, basically across the street. Um, I know that isn't part of this specific development, but a lot of people have reached out, you know, just to trying to understand, and again, whether, you know, that, that item is not on the agenda, so I'm not expressing an opinion <laughs> in support or against that specific proposal, but I think it's, it's worth asking uh, just where that conversation is at in terms of planning and whether or not the city is still considering um, approaches to address parking needs uh, yes. were they to become necessary. Yes, I think that just to be specific to that, um, HTA has worked with HCOG, and HCOG is working on a feasibility study for a parking garage, um, likely in that location. We've had discussions with Danco. They feel that this project, especially with the transit center, could potentially have available funding for that as well. Um, we'll also continue to um, push the, you know, with HTA and working on the micro transit and getting um, micro transit to go amongst the things, all of those things that were a part of the previous um, uh, MOU and the discussions about mitigations for parking concerns would, would also be included in this project. Um, obviously, the new transit center will have more frequent trips into Arcata and other locations, but we would also be looking at micro transit to get folks um, around Old Town and. And, and those type of things. I thought the thing that was really cool is that um, Greg at one point had brought, excuse me, uh, Director Pratt had brought up um, the possibility of kind of like the, and this is a little out there, so just forgive me, but similar to the, the scooters, there are um, communities out there that have pretty much scooters but mini cars where you roll up there and you put your credit card in there and you hop in the little car and go to where you need to go. It's pretty cool. So all of those things will be considered. I don't know if Greg has money for that, but we'll push him for it. <laughs> Thank you. Another? Um, this, this is just a, I, I was, you know, also, if folks haven't gotten a check, a chance to read the uh, Director Kenyon's 75-page CEQA <laughs> review, it's it's a thing of beauty, if, if that's your jam. Um, so I just highly recommend it. It really goes into a lot of detail. Um, so thank you for that. Um, in, in reading that, you know, there, there are certain uh, requirements for very low-income housing, low-income housing, 
Um, let's see. So there, and I saw two different numbers, so I just was wanting a little clarity. Personally, both I support. One is, um, let's see, was 40% affordable. And is that the same as low income? So, like, basically, if someone's making $49,500 a year, that would qualify as affordable housing? Yeah, it's based on the percentage of the median income. And so uh, I believe 60% of the median income, and that's for a single person I think you're referring to, that would be low income. And the very low income is 30% of the median income. And I'm pretty sure, and Kristen, please chime in if I'm wrong, but I believe that the requirement from our regional housing needs allocation in our housing element is um, 15 low income and five very low on each parcel, so that would be 30 low income and 10. I, Kristen, correct well, me if I'm and wrong. In the report it says 20 very low and 10 for a f for lower. Okay, I have it mixed up then, sorry. That would be accurate then. But the discussions that we've had for Danco is the intent is to, to, to definitely have more density than that and hopefully be able to provide um, mixed income levels in there as well, not just all affordable. Thank you. Councilmember Fernandez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, it, similar, similar vein, uh, so these would be deed restricted and these would be rental units? Correct, they'd be deed restricted rental units. I mean, there is a possibility for purchasing, but they would be deed restricted for 55 years, similar to all of our other projects. Can you tell me a bit more about the the potential there for ownership? I don't, we can do that. That's not the model that we've been discussing. If maybe Chris would, have you ever done any properties that have been for purchase or has it all been rental? He has. So that, that could be a discussion. It didn't seem like he was jumping all over that, but um, <laughs> that could be a discussion. But it's definitely something I feel worth discussing with this council just because, you know, rental units are good for what they are. But again, that opportunity to build that generational wealth, that stability, especially in our community, or in our community would be, I think, worth a discussion. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we do still have other properties available as a part of this housing element. And we do have the ability to discuss that specifically for properties and maybe look into that. I think that that may be a good idea. Right now, we're pretty far down the road. One of the reasons why we wanted to get this DDA in is that this project here will be com very competitive for tax credits. And um, getting this DDA in place is one of the requirements in order to apply yeah, don't for get those me wrong, tax credits. I'm not credits. trying to throw a wrench into this. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, we obviously, 2027, we're going to have more, but we do still have other properties that are, we have C to F. Um, I think that could be a discussion that we could have about other properties and potentially looking into a different model. Thank you. Anything further? Yeah. No questions. Okay, so we will go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is anyone here to comment on this item? Hi. Welcome. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening, Chris Dart, uh, President Danco Communities. Um, just, just grateful to be here again at the City of Eureka discussing a, um, a wonderful project, um, another wonderful project in the downtown. We're excited to take this vision that's been worked on for, I didn't realize it was that many years, but for that many years and um, take it from where it is and, and, and work to bring that uh, to reality. Um, Although this project has been being discussed for many years, and you know we're just getting started, um, we've been in a couple months now discussing this. Um, you know we believe that we are qualified to deliver this to deliver this uh, project and deliver the vision um, and and make it a reality. Um, the um, and we're you know we're we're open to the parking garage idea. We think that this project could potentially leverage funding uh, to help with that. Um, there, if it's tied to some of the affordable housing, that, that would be a, a something that we think could, could happen. Um, we know that this project means a lot to the city um, and a lot to HTA, and we take that very seriously. Um, and we will, we will be, um, you know, as, as the developer, if, if, if you vote on this, um, we would 
we would be, you know, in close conversations with HTA, the city of Eureka, to make sure that all parties are satisfied with the outcomes. Um, there's a, there will be a lot of intelligent people working on this. Um, met the group so far, and a lot of brain power that will be going into this and coming together. Um, that will happen over, you know, a long period of time. Not too long, though, but a longer period of time. Um, uh, we, you know, we're well staffed, poised, um, and ready to get started. If you do vote tonight, um, we, you know, just we appreciate your trust. We'll work diligently to design, permit, finance, and construct this project. Um, and as you know, that can that can take some time, but we will work, we will put all of our efforts in and make make this a priority. Um, and that's really all I got. If you have any specific things for me, I'm here. Um, if you want, ask me now. Feel free. Actually, we can wait till after public comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Hello and welcome. Good evening, Thomas Stewart Eureka. I'm here tonight to state publicly a loss. Unfortunately, here in the city of Eureka, there's been a death. It is so very sad. It's the death of common sense. It is sheer madness to take away vital infrastructure to merchants and businesses in Old Town. The employees of the businesses in Old Town need parking too. Do you really want to create a ghost town in Old Town? Taking away essential parking lots is like taking away a bridge on a highway or closing an airport, right? Parking is essential to the city of Eureka and the towns in Humboldt County. Without a car, your level of transportation is limited. Try shopping on a bicycle. I've tried that. Mm -hmm. Pearson's, I can't take home what I wanted to take home at Pearson's. This is a form letter we received from Eureka Main Street dated to January 21st, 2022, and I quote, this project was described as containing construction for lost parking space. This containing no consideration for lost parking spaces. The lot currently has 77 spaces and it's, it's a cause of parking deficit that will significantly detrimental to the area. Decreasing the availability of parking will be disastrous for local businesses that are already like, struggling. We are concerned about the potential economic impact that this will have on the neighboring businesses and the district as a whole. There are needs, there are needs for all parking services, all sectors of business operation, and current Old Town residents. This picture was taken recently. It is last week. You can see that. Shows um, 77 parking places. The picture shows three parking lots. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. Um, two cars looking for parking spaces. This picture shows three parking lots as well as the one you plan to eliminate. They are at full capacity, at full capacity. Today I surveyed the streets in Old Town for street park and I found an average of a total of 14 spaces per city block, a street parking spaces and four posts for bicycles. Walking around the entire block, I found seven vacant storefronts, seven vacant storefronts. Where are the new 99 residents and businesses of the new structure going to park their cars? Killing the ability to park your car is wrong, right? Do not make Old Town a ghost town. Killing the ability to park your car is just wrong, right? Thank you. Thank you. Again, please limit your. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm glad you're excited. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Kay Escarda, and I'm here to speak in favor of this project. I'm actually very excited about it. I know how long it takes to get any of these things going. We need housing so badly at all income levels. And we also need people downtown. Um, that's what downtowns are made of, of people and businesses and activity. And I am so excited to see this uh, going forward. I know it's been a long time coming. It's not there yet, but uh, I'm here to say yay. Let's go for it. Let's get some housing down there. Get people on the streets. 
get people uh, who work downtown, living downtown, and I think it's going to be a big uh, plus for Eureka. So I'm just here to say go for it, make it happen. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. So please don't badger people in the audience. Please don't badger people in the audience. Thank you. Let's be respectful. Thanks. If you guys had did your homework of all the boys that had businesses back 30 years, 40 years, I, I'm drawing a blank on a few, but the Dailies building. Wayne Wilson, he was sitting up here, and there's a few other people that were sitting up here, and they needed those park, parking spots. That's why it was put there. And I don't know what was ever underneath the parking lot, but for you guys to waive uh, environmental impact for a project, and uh, it's like you guys are God. What, what, let me get my notes. I've been going on too long. Earth Center. We are at the Native Sons Hall right across the street. That building was built in, uh, say, 1887. It's been a pioneer hall. I think we bought it in 1907. We have a dinner a month, a business meeting a month. You should come down and see our view from our building. And we have a renter downstairs. And you can look at the parking lot like Mr. Stewart had showed you pictures of. You think, and then this project that you're putting together, how much off street parking are you gonna have for all these people? And you would honestly, what, go five stories or three? You would do this to Mrs. Grooms, who has the brewery. You would do this to John Winsler, who has um, lease buildings right next door to us. The skateboard shop. I wish Kelly Martin was here to voice his opinion. Pick another lot. And then I don't understand what's, I don't know a few things that you got. No bid. It goes straight to Danco because he's did these. They're just going to line their pocket. Um, do you have out of town people that are you're working with, uh, or are they locals, you know, to design this earth center, the, the transit system, I was parked at native sons here. The two buses can't park where the bus stops are. I don't know if it's because that bus goes straight down third street farther, but they got their ass out in the street. They come by, clip the front end of my truck, we're having a dinner, and, and you guys are thinking that people are gonna rent these places, oh, and jump on the electric bus. You think a professor isn't gonna drive his Porsche or a doctor, at one time it's like, oh, doctors are gonna rent the three bedroom or the two bedroom or, I don't know if my time's up, but if that project was to go through and get started, I hope it burns like the one down on the bay you know what i mean because it's completely wrong park what about delta mattress oh they get to park across from the old bowling alley oh here stop by a mattress oh two nope there ain't a park spot go around the block then you're parking in winsler's other building where the engineers thank you. are your three minutes are up we appreciate it is you off being the charts here. you guys thank need you. to wake up your three Come minutes back are to up reality again your three minutes are up that again your three minutes are up thanks for being here So and again, your three minutes are up. I'm going to ask you to sit down, please. You Thank you for me. sitting down. We'll just blow the up. Thank you for sitting down. Thank you for sitting down. Uh, does anybody else in the audience care to comment on this item? You, have another three minutes? No. you can sit down, friend. Jeez, um, do we have anybody on Zoom? Althea? Yeah, um, so I am really glad that some of the other commenters brought up Daly's Department Store uh, because, you know, they were founded in 1895, I believe it was. And uh, if you look at the old maps, if you look at the old aerial photos, Daly's Department Store did not have any parking lots. And they thrived. Uh, if you read the... Humboldt historian, Please. you have 
um, Nada, Nada Gibson um, talking about how, you know, they used to take the streetcar down and dailies would, you know, deliver their shopping home for them. They thrived. Um, so, again, I'm glad people brought that up because, again, you can look at the historic photos. You can look at all that stuff. You had Daly's Department Store, J.C. Penney, all these stores, all these businesses downtown with dramatically less parking than we have today, and they were thriving. Um, I am sad to see that the very nicely designed Earth Center that um, we'd been expecting, I, I guess that design is no longer on the table, but um, HTA and Danco and the city, you will be hearing from me about design options. Um, I do... Um, I want to raise a concern about, you know, potentially having parking garages underneath it, um, just because the the actual financial cost of building those is so expensive. I didn't know how expensive it was until very recently, but um, I mean, <laughs> more than I make in a year to put in one parking space, you know, under a building. Um, it also takes away ground floor space for businesses, space for retail, space for fully wheelchair accessible apartments that aren't dependent on an elevator. Um, so I am pretty pretty concerned about that, um, that loss of space and the, the cost of building these places. Um, <laughs> as for the mini cars Miles was talking about um, as a form of microtransit, I'm not in favor of that. You know, not everybody drives. Not everybody is licensed as, dri as a driver. So, you know, that would still be inaccessible to a lot of people. Um, I would like to suggest pedicabs instead. Uh, if you're not familiar with a pedicab, it's sort of like a little... Mm -hmm. uh, almost like a rickshaw. <laughs> you know, that would provide jobs for people who might not be able to work in some other industries, but, you know, they're able to pilot a, a bicycle, they're able to pilot a pedicab. That gets you door to door, you know, service um, in an environmentally friendly way, in a low cost way. Um, so I would like to suggest that instead. Thank and, you, Althea. Uh, Your time is up. Thanks for being here. Colin? Good evening. Colin Fisk with CRTP, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. Uh, as you all know, CRTP uh, has long been a big supporter of the Earth Center project. Um, Eureka has needed for a long time uh, a modern multimodal transit center, obviously also needs uh, walkable and transit accessible housing. And so um, in general, you know, this project is a great way to fill both of those needs. Um, it's a little unfortunate that, you know, there have been so many delays so far, but uh, we would encourage you to do whatever you need to, to move the project uh, along and really particularly encourage you to uh, focus any resources available on providing that high quality transit center and those affordable housing units rather than, you know, any, as Althea said, uh, extremely expensive uh, extra parking spaces. I think, you know, the, the city's own studies show that there isn't a a lack of parking. If anything, what there is, is is a lack of sufficient parking management and strategies are known and those can be implemented to more efficiently use the parking available. Um, but this project really should focus all the available resources on providing a high quality transit center and as many affordable housing units on top of it as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Philip? Thank you. Um, I'm very excited about this. I see it as a, a seed being planted for, um, for, for a way of living that isn't really available to people right now. And, um, but all that aside, folks have already talked about some great things. Um, I, I, I just, I find it so surprising, um, that we're worried about business when we're adding people to an area. I'm excited to see how 
downtown businesses adapt and to see businesses fill up with locations serving the needs of a population that lives in our old town. I'm excited that it will enhance security, I believe, by adding more eyes on our old town area. And I'm very excited for a sense of vibrancy and community that comes from more people being there when I go. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Do you see anyone else? I see no one else. Okay, so we will close this public hearing then and bring it back to council for comments. Council Member Castellano. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you could tell I was excited. Um, first, I just want to say I, I, th I think I confused things by asking about uh, parking at another location. There, there's no consideration that there would be a parking garage included in this particular development. Um, that would be a more, it, it's being considered for a property adjacent and is definitely by and far a very different conversation, but I just thought it may be useful for people to understand that um, conversations around kind of the larger context in which this development is taking place are definitely happening. And, and you know, and as folks know who have been with us for a while, um, you know, these conversations take place kind of in little pockets here and there, and so sometimes it can be hard to, it, it can be easy to lose track of the more cohesive picture. Um, I, I do serve on the board of directors for HTA, and so from that vantage point, I'm very excited to see this moving forward. You know, this has been part of a long time goal for Humboldt Transit Authority to really centralize um, the, the resource of transit and, you know, and just make it more accessible. Um, it also, oh. I'm sorry, um, Mayor and Council, we had, we didn't ask if everyone had spoke on uh, Zoom. We do have a hand raised. Oh, if we could uh, oh, pause. Uh, listen to that speaker. Yes, I thought I did ask. I, I think the hand, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Patty, welcome. How do you have your hand raised? She raised last She's still on. Patty, did you have public comment? Okay. You're muted. For folks who are watching, we're, we're trying to help a, a public commenter um, access public comment. And so I think, uh, and thank you to city staff for I think madly trying to text this person and, and offer them as much opportunity as, as able uh, to, to make public comment. She apparently was having technical issues and rejoined the meeting the moment before public comment ended. Right. This is willing to go to any length, they say. Okay, hold on a second. Yeah. Okay, you're good. Okay. Hey, I I not having technical issues. I I'm pushing your um Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I 
Anyway, there's a there's a delay here. Okay. Okay. Your timer's going. Your timer's going, Patty. Well, okay. Yeah, thanks. That was really weird. Um, I just want to bring it full full circle and say um, to Athena, um, I don't think uh, your comparisons of of where we're at in today's world and where they were in downtown Eureka or even uh, comparing apples to apples, but whatever. Um, uh, it's interesting on, on my thoughts on these projects, but I, I go full circle. I think the big elephant in the room is um, what are we going to do about keeping our community safe? So you might have a hundred people down there living. How are you going to keep them safe? We went out to dinner tonight and we were approached by a homeless man, crazy, batshit crazy, telling us to fuck off. He was going to kick our ass, put us in jail. We literally only had to walk probably 50 feet from Luis's restaurant to our car and just about got attacked. So as you travel down the road of all these pretty projects, I think you could do um, the young man a big favor that spoke tonight and make sure that the community he is speaking of and growing up in is kept safe. I think it's super important. Is that it, Patty? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Councilmember Castellano, do you remember where you were in your thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll find my way. <laughs> um, and thank you so much, uh, City Manager Slattery, for really uh, making sure that everyone who wanted to make public comment could. Um, and thank you for everyone who has made comment tonight. Um, so. I'll try to pick up my train of thought, um, no problem at all. Um, so from, from my HTA standpoint, you know, I'm very excited to see this move forward and really bring greater accessibility, um, not only to the city of Eureka and people who live there, but also to the entire region as we really to, uh, have been working to develop uh, regional strategies for public transit. Um, as someone who works in Old Town, has lived in Old Town, has uh, had a small business in Old Town, um, I personally am thrilled. I, I do park in that parking lot um, and will gladly walk an extra couple of blocks um, or ride the bus or walk to work. Um, you know, I, I live about a 15 minute walk away um, in order to ensure that people have access to housing. Um, you know, most everyone I know who works in Old Town would qualify to live in this housing and is paying far more than 30% um, of their income for rent. So in terms of like my responsibility to the workforce of the city of Eureka, to the employees who work for the organization that I work for, I am thrilled to support this because uh, it, in just a very, very quick survey of the people who, who actually work um, across the street from this, you know, of like, would you live in housing um, here in Eureka if given the chance to only pay 30% of your income? People were so excited at that opportunity. And so this is for almost, you know, the, the hundreds of people who are working in the service industry, in the nonprofit sector, in Old Town every day that I will uh, be excited to support this. Also, you know, the, the TERSIP grant that the HTA has does have a time signature on it, so I understand that there, there is some need to, you know, get this moving forward. We've been waiting a really long time, and thank you to Director Pratt for your patience on this. You know, I know it's been uh, a, a little stressful, you know, at the HTA end, so I appreciate you continuing to want to partner with the City of Eureka on this. Um, and, you know, and just to say, I had lunch with a dear friend of mine who lives in the senior housing that Danco built. I had lunch with her on Saturday and oh my gosh, what a game changer being able to live in that housing has been for her and for her life to have that financial support, stability and to be in a beautiful new new place to live. Um, thank you. Um, it's it's made a, a, an amazing impact on her life. I, and I just want to say, you know, I think that it, it's proven that investing money in people who are uh, lower income has a greater economic impact than any other kind of investment. So when we're talking about 
freeing up income that people are spending on rent that they won't make back, that they can't invest in the community, they can't invest and put towards housing. This, these are people who are most likely to reinvest that money that they're saving back into the community. And so I am thrilled for local businesses to have people who all of a sudden have potentially 20 to 30 percent more of their salary that they can save, they can spend, they can go out to eat in Old Town. Um, I think it's going to make a big difference to have that many people who all of a sudden have like a little more money to spend who've been like seeing like 50 60 percent of their income they're making every month go just to paying rent uh, and so I could continue for all of the reasons I'm supporting this but uh, I'll stop there and let my other council members have a chance to speak thank you council member Contreras Deloach yeah, I, I also, you know, just kind of giving this a lot of thought. I mean, the, uh, you know, this is in my ward, um, as are a lot of the projects. And um, and I am very supportive of our businesses. And, and, I, and I do acknowledge that, you know, uh, placing housing there is going to place a strain on parking. I understand that. Um, but I think we do... Uh, you know, of those two, I think, you know, when you're facing a situation where there's people who do not have places to live um, and we have a serious housing shortage here and I'm not necessarily feeling that I was able to purchase my home a few years ago. Um, but I know other people that are feeling that and we were when we were renting. And I one of the things I want to share is I was talking with one of our fishermen uh, two days ago and fishing has been really impacted. And I was talking about some of the different plans for, you know, uh, actually we're talking about the gravel lot, um, the, the massive gravel lot. And I was saying, you know, maybe hopefully we'll see something like this out or the other thing. And they, and they asked, well, you know, what's, so what, what, what do they think is going to go there? And I said, low and very low where we, you know, we have this plan. And they said, that would be me. Like I, I would, that would give me a place to be. And I, as I've gotten to know different community members, but specifically lately getting to know some of our fishermen um, and understanding some of the concerns that they have about different things, um, they're really hoping for housing options because uh, they don't have them. And a lot of people are stuck in really subpar uh, rentals that are not safe and not clean. And um, this would make a huge impact for a lot of people. Um, I have sometimes mixed feelings about some of our subsidized housing because I believe that it exists in part because employers do not look out for their employees the way that they should, and they pass the bill for all of that onto the rest of society. And so I do have an issue with it from that perspective. But ultimately, the bottom line, it doesn't matter, is we have to kind of decide what we're going to do and how are we going to address that. And I think it's so critical that we find ways to provide housing for people who um, who are contributing to our communities. They're a part of our communities. They deserve to have a place to live. And I think that, that it takes priority over um, I'm willing to walk further. I, I have to travel a lot everywhere I go. I usually have to park my car in 10 buck two, and I'm going to be walking very, very long distances. I'm going to be paying, you know, three or four dollars at least to park. I was just in DC. I paid twenty-one dollars to park. So there, we still have a much easier situation here. I'm willing to walk seven or eight blocks um, if it means that there are people here that get to live in a clean apartment. Um, those are kind of my feelings on that. Councilmember Bauer, I appreciate both. You know, Council Member Castellano and um, Contreras Deloach's comments, they're, they're very eloquent, and you said it all. Um, I'm looking at page three of the CEQA review document, and there's a picture from 1947 of Old Town. And what you'll notice, and I'm, not to be flippant or anything, but there was no parking lots, you know? And, and the community, it worked community made it work because there were thriving businesses and there were people living down there and we made it work. And so that's what I think we're doing here is we're trying to make it work. We need housing more than anything. And if we have to be, some of us have to be a little bit inconvenienced by having to walk further or something, uh, you know, I'm willing to do that. Like, like you were saying, um, 
because the number one thing across America is a lack of housing. And so we have to do better and we have to sacrifice. And that's the hardest part as a community that we have to set. We have to there's shared sacrifice when it comes to providing for our community members and giving others the opportunity that a lot of us have, have a house, have a, have a place to, to stay. So this is what we have to do. Um, and I, I know people will, will be upset by it, but, um, you know, this is the most critical thing that we have in our community, the most critical need. And so I, I hope we can do this with, with uh, all speed and alacrity. Thank you. Council Member Moulton. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you uh, for the information, City Manager Slattery, and for the detailed, for the, they just a lovely report. Um, I especially liked page 71, <laughs> which is a definition of terms uh, and uh, acronyms. Uh, we get lost in, in alphabet soup a lot of times. Um, that's always very helpful. I'm going to post that one on my wall. Um, I'm, so we have a responsibility to use the public uh, resources for the public good and what we think is going to be the best public good for our community. Um, when the lots were built, that good meant let's get some people to finally come to the businesses in Old Town. It meant let's get this brand new awesome thing that everybody has, a car, and give them a place to put it. And uh, times change and needs change. And I love what um, some folks are saying about downtown is made of activity. It's made of people. I run a business in Old Town. My regulars are the residents. I, I, um, I feel the most secure and safe walking around anywhere uh, when there's more people around. And I look forward to a time when all of the businesses in Old Town have additional hundreds of customers within a stone's throw. I look forward to when a grocery store sees it, uh, another grocery store, a small maybe convenience store wants to open up down there. There's so many possibilities. And, um, you know, despite some of the, or despite some storefronts looking empty, it's actually quite, uh, quite packed down there on the retail front, on the ground level. Uh, I think, you know, above all though, I think that um, at this point in this town right now, choosing an underutilized parking lot over affordable housing when people are sleeping on the streets, when families are living in their cars, when I have students whose families are living two and three families to a house because even if they could afford it, they can't find housing. There's just not available. And choosing an additional parking space so that there's a little, so people can walk a little bit less in our vibrant and beautiful old town just seems inhumane. That's all. Thank you. Councilmember Fernandez. Uh, just going back briefly to the CEQA exemption, this is, this is written within CEQA that we can exempt this based on the general plan, based on the needs that we see within this community. And I don't need to touch on the points that have already been touched on regarding the need for housing here, uh, <laughs> regarding the need uh, to, to house the homeless population that we have. Uh, but if the concern is about disability access or safety, then, then yeah, we likely need to review our disability access as it relates to transit, as it relates to parking currently in Old Town on our public spaces. Uh, but also going to the point of, I, I think Council Member Moulton, you kind of hit on it there with regards to when we have the increased population that we do down there, whether it's from uh, just the activities of Friday Night Market or Arts Alive or Fourth of July, generally people are feeling safer down there because there's more observation. There's more relation to each other at that point. And to have this type of project in that central location, I think there's more of that passive ownership uh, of people wanting to feel safe in their community. I'd like there to be more general ownership, but that's a later conversation that we'll have. Um, but it, it also goes back to, I think, what was already touched on by another council member, which is that uh, we have an opportunity here to at least address some of the issues around housing. Granted, the parking's gonna be inconvenient, it's gonna be impacted, but 
we can solve that through any number of means that have already been touched on. And uh, unless there's anyone else willing to speak, I'd like to make the motion to approve this resolution. Would you? Yeah. I always have trouble with this. Am I? Wanted to. <laughs> unless Leslie would like to, because it sounds like you already have it lined up. Sure, I got it lined up. <laughs> I would love to make a motion on this, thanks. Um, I uh, making a motion to hold a public hearing and adopt a resolution finding the project exempt from CEQA, uh, CEQA, and authorizing the city manager to enter into a disposition and development agreement, DDA, with Danco Communities for development of the Earth Center. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Please vote. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. Okay, that takes us to, what did I do with my glasses? There they are. That takes us to the consent calendar. All matters listed under this category are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. Pursuant to City Council Resolution 2011-22, if a member of the public would like an item on the consent calendar pulled and discussed, Separately, the request shall be made to a council member prior to the meeting. Unless a specific request is made by a council member, the consent calendar will not be read. There will be no separate discussion of these items. So my understanding is, I haven't heard anybody want to pull anything? No, good. So can we get a motion? I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Second. Oh. Please. Oh, uh, me. <laughs> we have a motion is second, please vote. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. Great. So legislative action correspondence, do we have any? <laughs> Council I, Member Bauer? No, and I already talked about it with our uh, attorney. Um, there's a companion bill for the one that was on the consent calendar in the Senate, and I forget the number right now, but I think we need to also support that since it's the exact same bill just in the other chamber. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And that moves us to ordinances and resolutions. And up next is a resolution calling for ceasefire in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, City Attorney Luna. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is the second time that this, uh, that a version of this resolution has been before the Council. Uh, the earlier version that was brought uh, to the council after uh, quite lengthy discussion did not um, did not garner the the motion and second that it needed to move forward to a vote, and so uh, we've been asked. Can I offer a correction? Yeah, we, pulled we pulled it. it. There was no oh, action taken. It. Yeah. I thank you very much for offering it. that correction. I appreciate it. Uh, after. Uh, Further action by some local agencies. Um, this has been put back on uh, in a version that is very similar to the the versions that have been discussed and passed by both Arcata and the County of Del Norte. And so it is here before you for discussion and adoption. If the councils, County of Humboldt or Del Norte? <gasps> oh my goodness, Tay, Del Norte. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearkening back to a job I had three years ago. How how odd! Thank you again for that correction. I'm gonna stop speaking now and um, and let you, <laughs> let you guys take over. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for City Attorney Luna? Uh, Councilmember Fernandez. Uh, you had referenced that this had, or the similar resolution had been passed at various other municipalities and at the county level. Are, are there any significant deviations from those? Just insert Eureka? Basically, okay. just okay. insert Eureka, yes. Um, I did, you know, look this over, and I'm not saying that there weren't a few other very minor changes, but uh, nothing of substance was, okay. was modified. Thank you. Other questions? No. Okay, so seeing no other questions, we'll open this up for public comment. Would you care to speak? Welcome. 
Good evening. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this tonight. Um, my name is Micah Starr, um, and I, I have to say I, I come up to you with a lot of emotions. First and foremost, gratitude that, uh, particularly for Council Member Castellano, for bringing this matter back to the agenda, and for all of you for taking the time to reconsider. Um, I'm also feeling so much pain, as I'm sure we all are. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to ask, I mean, raise your hand if you feel comfortable, but like, has anyone here ever directly lived through active war? Okay, I didn't know if maybe we had um, veterans in attendance earlier, but um, uh, forgive me. We are incapable of imagining the level of suffering, destruction, and loss of human life that has occurred since October in Palestine. And for so, so long, the roots of this conflict aren't October 7th of 2023. They're not 1967, not 1945, not even 1918. It's so, so further back. The conflict over who gets to live in this land is so old. But we're in a moment now, and I feel anger. I want to ask, why did we wait? Why did we push this conversation until later when we could have acted to pass a ceasefire resolution? Um, and, you know, I can talk about the specifics of the resolutions, but I do did want to note and appreciate that the current resolution uh, includes respect for international law, which would mean the U.S. Um, pausing support for Israel and uh, for many arrests to be made. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but I, I did want to say thank you for considering this again. And um, I wanted to invite the community also to an event. Uh, it's an art exhibit, memorial, and um, cultural event called Birds for Palestine, in which community members have made art on birds honoring the deaths of Palestinian children. Uh, it's on June 15th from 2 to 5 p.m., 1928 Old Arcata Road in Bayside. Um, and it's never too late to take action, whether it's here or in our own personal lives. So thank you. Thank you, Micah. Shannon? Shannon, you have your hand raised. Hi there. I wanted to thank you for putting this on the agenda and I hope you pass it. Um, I really second the sentiments shared by the previous speaker. Um, I'm just, I, there are no words to describe what we are doing. We, I say this because this is our, this is our money, our tax money going to slaughter babies elderly, disabled women, to ruin water wells, to specifically target hospitals where people are getting care for terminal and acute illnesses, to destroy uh, virtually every single aspect of the environment. Um, this is a watershed moment in our time that we are living through, witnessing, you know, we were lucky not to live through it as in being there but we're watching it with this guilt that we are all taking in. We all are going to be hearing, feeling this collective guilt. Um, and then all the things that you guys are talking about and dealing with, it touches on this, you know, uh, the housing crisis. What the heck are we doing bombing people's homes on another side of the planet right now? When we can't even house our own people and we're spending our taxpayer dollars doing that. It makes no sense at all. Making more refugees, making more immigrants to destabilize other regions. I mean, this is absolutely insane. So I just 
appreciate Leslie Kitsawana bringing this back and I appreciate the council to be open to this. I know people are scared to talk about this because we get, uh, we get attacked personally. I've been personally attacked for speaking out against what is so obviously wrong that I can witness with my own eyes and feel it with my own heart. And I have a spine still to say something about it. And I think that we are moving towards hopefully, uh, this is a reckoning that Americans will have. You know, the, the, the young man that spoke about Martin Luther King and nonviolence, hopefully his generation will, uh, will, will be the beacon of light to move us away from perpetual war, which is what America has been doing for the last over half century. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Do you see anyone else, Shannon? Is there any anyone else on Zoom that would like to comment? I see no one else. Okay, so we'll bring it back to council for comments and a motion. Any comments? Any motion? Councilmember Moulton? I just wanted to make a comment. I also want to thank um, Councilmember Castellano for bringing this back up. I know that um, when we're speaking for um, the whole council, especially when we're speaking for the city, uh, that it's important that we get the words really right. And it, I, I do think, even though there was a delay, that it was worth it was worth going back and making sure we were really saying what we really wanted to say. Um, and uh, I just wanted to take this moment to reach out to the people in our community who are suffering. I know that this has impacted people uh, directly. <laughs> uh, folks getting um, friends of mine, you know, receiving threats and. Uh, awful comments, and that this uh, has reached into into our little city. And I wanted to s just express support for them. Um, that a nonviolent resolution and nonviolent ways of living um, start at home. But I'll let you let me make the motion. Councilmember Castellano. Um, oh, I thought your hand, your hand wasn't raised. <laughs> sure, I'm sorry. Um, I, I also want to thank uh, Councilmember Fernandez for you know expressing a lot of leadership um, on this issue uh, or this item earlier. Um, yeah, I just appreciate that um, there isn't you know any one person who's um, the bastion of peace or that you know and, and that it's something that we, I mean, for me, being in a practice of peace and, and care for community is a, a learning and growing process, and I certainly couldn't do it without um, the conversations that I've had from the, from the public and the people who have come to us, as well as other council members. And I just want to say I also, you know, re respect disagreement, respect uh, challenges around this. Um, item and, uh, you know, and, and want to own my own, uh, yeah, just my own questions, you know, as we've been working on this and br bringing it forward that, um, you know, we, we, we make the road by walking, I think is a, a version of it, you know, and, and that um, though, you know, we've received some critique that, you know, perhaps like the city of Eureka doesn't have anything to do with international conflict or things like that. But I do think um, the city of Eureka, you know, we're, we're a global community now. And I think it's part of the role we have is to, you know, there, there aren't great opportunities for discourse around these deeply entrenched and complicated challenges and so you know we we bring it here and that um i just want to appreciate continuing to be in a community that learns and tries and tries to say something and tries to express our values and i do deeply value 
like changing the world, you know, and, and maybe that's happening here, you know, in small ways with the work we're doing, you know, with the, the work our police force is doing and partnering with social services, you know, and, and that those kinds of steps are what we're, we're doing here. Um, and that, you know, we're engaging in ways of saying that, you know, these systems that are based on deep inequities are not serving us um, as humans. And so, you know, let's keep working together towards peace. So uh, with that, uh, I will make a motion to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Eureka calling for ceasefire in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Second. Okay, we have a first and second. Uh, Council Member Contreras Deloach. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this briefly. Um, I appreciate um, our uh, Attorney Luna for, um, I know you were using what had already been written, but I just, uh, I'm appreciative. Um, I would not, what came before us in December, the emails that we received, I read all of them, the three and four page uh, proposals, I would never have been in favor of, and I would have adamantly spoken against because of the language that was in, in those. Um, and uh, and and so for myself personally, that's why that that's why no, um, back in December, and um, uh, because I wasn't willing to take a position on those things. Um, so you know, with this now, you know, reading this, um, you know, I'm appreciative of the neutral language, and I there was something that I you know I've thought about this a lot and thought about kind of where people are at, but there was this. Um, quote by Krishnamurti, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I was thinking about just how um, <clears throat> that all of us watching this, and I think people have, you know, taken different sides but, um, on different things. Um, but ultimately, I would hope that the side would be humanity and a care and concern for all human beings. Um, and so I appreciate where this resolution is now because that's what it's speaking to and it's um you know we're not going to affect it um this resolution is not going to affect it um but i'm appreciative um, that we've found a way to say that we don't support these things and that this is a sign of a world sickness and it's a terribly devastating thing so council member bauer i just want to point out two things in the resolution that we reject violence and we embrace peace. Who could be against that? I mean, that's, that's the simplest way to live. Um, war is abhorrent and it needs to end. And if, if this resolution uh, leads towards that path, then who can't support that? So, I. I'm, uh, I'm happy this is back, and I'm, um, I'm glad we're taking care of it here today. Thank you. Thank you. And I, too, would like to make a comment. That's okay. I don't get to vote, but I can make a comment. Um, so when this first came about, um, I, too, I, I thought that it was very lengthy and that really, you know, it really wouldn't make an impact on a worldview. Um, and that was my thoughts. And I also didn't like seeing everything that was going on in our own city and in our own region behind all this. Um, I was reading the other day, well, not the other day, it's been a while now. I've been at home, so I've been having lots of time to read. And I was reminded by one of my heroes, who was spoke about tonight, Martin Luther King, that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And that, that really struck me because you know, maybe, maybe this resolution, maybe it won't make a difference in the world, but I really believe strongly that it will make a difference in our community because we are embracing something that is true, honest, and real. Um, you know, my kids went to a Montessori Peace School, so we've always been a big proponent of looking at ways to have nonviolent communication and to, to to mitigate things without having to have violence or screaming or yelling. And I think that's sometimes why public comment can be such an issue for me. <laughs> when people are yelling and creating all this drama, when it really has, has nothing to do with, it's, it's not helpful. 
Um, but I digress. So what I want to say is that I'm really appreciative that we that that we have this very simple language. You know, one of the things that came up for me is, what about Ukraine? What about all these places that we're involved in that are creating these similar situations? What about, you know, why not add them all? And, it, you know, I, in my heart, I think that I will add them all, I, personally. But in here, I can see the, the need for this, this uh, singular path. So um, I hope that through passing this resolution, if it passes, that um, it will begin to heal again, heal our community, uh, and help us to work together in more um, appropriate ways instead of the divisiveness, that, divisiveness that's been happening. Because that's how we grow. You know, working through divisiveness, we can we can grow and become better people uh, together. So, um, with that, there's a motion and a second, right? And there's a comment from Mario. I mean, Councilmember Fernandez. Uh, I, I think everyone here has already succinctly said what I would say, so I think I've been outspoken in the public enough that I don't need to reiterate anything. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I didn't call on you yet. <laughs> I just spoke up right before you. All right, we have a second and a motion. Motion and a second, please vote. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. Thank you. And with that, we're going to take a seven minute break. We will resume the council meeting with reports and action items. Director Millar, proposed budget introduction. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Good uh, tonight's report is on the fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget. Uh, you can tell it's a budget item because there's a giant crowd behind me. <laughs> so uh, we'll begin by looking at the current fiscal year. There's a few things I want to touch on that will help us understand where we're headed. Uh, the next section is a overview of the 24-25 proposed budget by type. So I won't be talking about departments tonight. I'll be talking about budget categories. And then finally, we'll talk about the budget study session. Um, this is a subsequent meeting that happens after the budget is introduced. So to begin with where we are today and how that's going to impact the future, uh, we're going to look at the general fund, and we're going to start with general general fund revenues. Uh, so here's the 23-24 adopted budget as a pie chart. Uh, this pie chart represents about 41 and a half million in revenues. Uh, you'll notice that the largest slice of that pie is the category of taxes. Uh, the city has a number of different tax types. Uh, you'll notice that there are property tax, TOT or bed tax, and other. Other includes things like business license tax. Uh, these are substantial amounts of revenue, uh, but they don't typically change very much from year to year. Uh, property tax, uh, it really never goes down, but it doesn't grow at a high rate. Uh, TOT has been pretty flat for a, the past couple fiscal years. Um, it's consistent, but again, I don't expect much, much growth in this category unless we were to assume uh, a new uh, hotel operation. Uh, the biggest um, type of tax that we receive is sales tax, so about $27 million in uh, fiscal year 23-24. So going back in time, um, you can see that back in fiscal year 2021, we had uh, that yellow box, that was Measure Q. Measure Q was a half cent uh, sales tax. Uh, it was replaced by Measure H, uh, a one and a quarter cent sales tax. Uh, Measure H essentially provided the general fund with about seven and a half additional or million dollars in addition to what was there before. Uh, unfortunately, since fiscal year 21-22, our sales tax revenues have been relatively flat, if not down. 
Uh, just recently, I received an update from HDL companies. Uh, we use an outside firm to help us forecast sales tax revenues. Uh, they indicated that uh, revenues in this fiscal year were even or were down even further from what they had estimated. And if you compare that to fiscal year 21-22, we're down about a million dollars in sales tax revenues. Uh, looking at the other side of the equation, uh, we're going to look at expenditures. So these are expenditures represented as a pie graph. Um, in the current fiscal year, we adopted a budget of about $41.5 in expenditures, so essentially a balanced budget. I want to look at three different categories of this pie chart. Uh, starting with personnel, we know what this represents. This, this is the pay and the benefits that we provide to uh, city employees. Uh, but I also want to note that in this category, outside services, uh, the majority of that is what we provide to Humble Bay Fire, uh, about 75% of that piece of pie. And their budget of about $6.9 million uh, is about 90% salaries and benefits. And then when we look at this slice of pie, cost allocation, uh, this is where charges such as finance or IT or the city manager's office uh, those are cost centers, and those get allocated out to the different funds and different departments, and they show up under the cost allocation category. Uh, if I were to look at this category and separate the personnel costs from the non-personnel costs, uh, you would find that about 42% of that slice of pie is also salaries and benefits. So in conclusion, uh, to show you a, another pie graph with the same data, but to separate personnel costs versus non-personnel costs, about 69% of all dollars spent in the general fund have to do with salaries and benefits. Uh, why I point this out is because of what has happened this fiscal year in terms of labor agreements. So the city has three employee groups, uh, the EPOA, the ECEA, and a group of unrepresented employees. Uh, all three groups um, are going to begin new contracts starting in July. Uh, these contracts will last three years. Um, all staff in every group will receive COLAs at the beginning of every fiscal year. Uh, this July, uh, staff will see the largest increase. On top of that, uh, most staff will receive additional longevity increases. So to summarize where we're headed based on what's happening now, I think I just want people to walk away with two main ideas. The first one is that sales tax revenues are underperforming forecasts. Uh, sales tax revenues tend to work in, or tend to show trends. So things don't go up and down every fiscal year. They tend to take a downward projection and that might continue for a couple years until it turns around. Uh, so that's something that we should expect um, based on how HDL has been forecasting our sales tax revenues recently. And then the other side of the equation shows that our salaries and benefits, the biggest slice of pie, um, are increasing and they will continue to increase. Um, this presents a challenge it's not a crisis, but it's something to keep in mind and something to remember when we're looking what's happening uh, or what's um, projected to happen next fiscal year. All right, so the 24-25 proposed budget. So we're going to look at the major funds. Uh, we have one major governmental fund. That's the general fund, our main operating fund. Uh, we also have a number of enterprise funds. Uh, these operate <coughs> differently than the general fund. Um, the water fund is uh, in charge of delivering water to our utility customers. The wastewater fund is in charge of treating that water. Uh, when we receive revenue for water, uh, it must go back into that fund. Uh, when we get revenue for uh, sewer or wastewater, it goes back into fund 510. 
Uh, same thing with the Harbor Fund and the Building Fund. When we do a building permit, it goes back into that fund. Uh, they're more self-sustainable um, in the sense that they are charging for a service and that service is going back into the system to support that system. In addition to these governmental and enterprise funds, we have what's called an internal service fund. Uh, we have a series of funds or cost centers that are essentially overhead. Uh, we have equipment operations. Uh, that's the city's uh, vehicle fleet. We have risk management. So we pay for liability insurance and workers' comp insurance. Uh, those get allocated out to the other funds. Uh, IT, government and admin. So that's the council, the city manager, city attorney, HR, finance, and economic development, and then facilities. Uh, the way these funds work is that they, we figure out a way on how to allocate out those charges, whether it's number of computers, uh, number of FTEs, or the size of the budget, and their revenue comes from these other funds. Oops. So essentially, uh, the flow of money is going in that direction. In addition, some of these funds charge each other. So. Facilities and equipment operations, uh, they use computers, so a piece of IT is actually allocated out uh, horizontally. Uh, so to begin, we're gonna look at the internal service funds and we're gonna look at expenses because revenues are essentially just reimbursements through those cost allocation accounts. So beginning with equipment operations, uh, we're gonna look at types of expenses uh, personnel is going up by about 9.2%. Um, this is a reoccurring theme. Uh, you know, as we increase salaries, uh, you'll see that in the budget and you'll see that across all funds and all departments. Uh, same thing with, or I'm sorry, uh, cost allocation as well. Uh, cost allocation in general is going up at a higher rate than most funds, but it's also, <clears throat> there's additional pressure from the increases in salaries and benefits. Uh, outside services in this fund are going up due to increases in our contract with Enterprise for uh, leasing vehicles, as well as an increase to um, budgets that help us uh, outfit our vehicles. Uh, capital outlay is going up. Uh, for additional vehicle purchases. And overall, this fund is uh, poised to grow about 7.3%. Uh, the next fund is risk management. So there's only one category in this fund. Um, essentially, all the monies that come out of this fund are going to pay for uh, insurance products. Um, unfortunately, uh, our liability insurance is going up um, by about 12.7%. So overall, the fund is going up about, by about 12.7%. Next, we have IT. Uh, IT's <coughs> seeing increases in personnel, some increases due to software costs, as well as for cost allocation. Uh, government and admin. So if you notice, personnel costs are going up by 30%, which is above average. Um, that is because when we compare to fiscal year 23-24, uh, we've added and are proposing to add about 3.7 FTE, or full-time positions. Uh, that, in addition to the increase in salaries and benefits, is creating a higher than average uh, growth rate. Uh, cost allocation is about, <coughs> about average. And then finally, we have facilities. So facilities is going up pretty much in every category, uh, not substantially, but based on the, their size of budget, um, things are increasing by about 14% on average. Next, we'll look at the enterprise funds. So starting with the water fund. So the water fund has this one category, uh, charges for services. So when we send out water bills and people pay their water bills, it comes through in this category. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, we probably over projected for fiscal year 23-24. Uh, so we're expecting a slight increase in the 24-25 budget. Uh, water rates will go up in July. So there is we do expect uh, revenues to be higher next year than they are this year. When we're looking at expenses, again, uh, personnel is going up. Uh, materials and supplies are going up due to increases in the cost of the wholesale water, as well as increases to um, water meters and water meter parts. Uh, outside services are going up due to uh, increases in merchant card fees. So when you use a Visa card, whether that's online or on the first floor, uh, we have to pay the credit card processor. Uh, those fees have become more and more substantial because more and more people are using the online system as well as paying with card. Uh, we're also seeing increases to electricity. Uh, again, increases to the cost allocation and then transfers. Uh, in this category, um, what that shows is are monies being transferred to the water CIP fund to pay for water projects. Uh, the past couple of fiscal years, we've spent <clears throat> above or larger than normal amounts on water projects. So next year, um, what is showing is a decrease, even though that's that was expected. So overall, uh, in the current fiscal year, we um, showed a small uh, budget surplus, and we expect another budget surplus in the water fund for fiscal year 24-25. Next, we have the wastewater fund. So just like the water fund, uh, your wastewater or your uh, utility bills uh, go back into this fund. Um, it is showing a substantial increase in revenues. Uh, it's somewhat misleading. A lot of that revenue is coming from the sewer lateral and loo fees. Uh, this is really a timing difference. Um, we collect those fees as real estate transactions happen or as uh, remodels happen. Uh, that's going to go into the fund balance or reserves and be used for future uh, sewer lateral replacements that occur in the cities right away. On the expense side, in, um, we expected increases to personnel. Uh, outside services are going up. Uh, due to charges for electricity, uh, merchant card fees, as well as lab testing, uh, cost allocation up, and then transfers for wastewater projects uh, is going down, but we still expect to spend a substantial amount of money on wastewater um, CIP projects. Uh, overall, we expect a, a surplus of about a million dollars in the wastewater fund next year. Next, we have the Harbor Fund. So the Harbor Fund is uh, expecting an increase for charges for services. Uh, the Harbor Fund controls a lot of uh, properties on the waterfront, and we have leases. Uh, every year, we look at those leases, and we apply a CPI increase. And due to the high rates of inflation, uh, those lease or rent amounts have gone up quite a bit. And then we do subsidize the Harbor Fund. So monies from the general fund go over to help the Harbor Fund. Uh, we are increasing that subsidy by about $43,000 to make sure that this fund um, stays balanced. On the expense side, uh, We've added personnel into this fund, so it's growing higher, or the growth rate is higher than normal. And because it's a relatively small personnel budget, uh, sometimes when you add personnel, those growth rates are um, kind of exaggerated based on the, the relatively small budget. Uh, cost, cost allocation is going up quite a bit as well. Um, that's mainly because when you increase FTEs in a fund, uh, the cost allocation charges are going to follow because a lot of expenses in those internal service funds are based on FTEs. Uh, 
And sorry to interrupt, Director Millar, but I'm sure some of council FT is a full time equivalent position. Uh, so in the current fiscal year, we showed a balanced budget, and next fiscal year, there's a slight deficit, but uh, mostly a balanced budget. And finally, the building fund. So the building fund has been doing really well in terms of permit fees. Uh, there's enough uh, history that I'm comfortable raising the budget or the estimated revenue level. Uh, that's a good thing because what it's done, it's essentially eliminated the need for a subsidy from the general fund. So it's become more self-sustainable. On the expenditure side, uh, we're showing increases to personnel and cost allocation and a small dollar amount to materials and supplies, which translates to a, a fairly high rate of change. Uh, overall, balanced budget this year, and essentially a balanced budget is expected next fiscal year. So last but not least, the general fund. So I've done more pie charts. Uh, this time it's with the 24-25 proposed budget. Um, you might notice that the, the taxes slice of pie is slightly down. Um, that's because there's a couple other categories that are growing and relative to the tax revenue, um, they're taking more of the share. So to begin at the top, uh, unfortunately tax revenue overall is expected to drop by less than 1%. Oops. Uh, so, and to show you that graph again um, that I showed earlier on in the presentation, uh, I would call sales tax revenue flat, but technically it is slightly down. Uh, intergovernmental, so this category is where we collect uh, monies or reimbursements from grants. Uh, we expect a large increase in this category, mainly due to our program's with uh, Uplift and Care. Um, they've been very successful in acquiring grant monies and we expect that to continue. In charges for services, uh, that large increase is mainly due to uh, operations at the zoo. Um, they have, or there's been pleasant surprises from uh, zoo revenues. Uh, they continue to exceed uh, estimates and continue to break records. Uh, so I'm comfortable increasing our revenue estimates because we have enough history to support um, that level of revenue. In the miscellaneous category, um, I've included some monies for or received from uh, interest. Uh, the city with <coughs> um, the reserve levels at where where they're at, I've been able to put the money into treasury bonds. Uh, those bonds are um, <clears throat> bringing in between 4 and 5% currently. Uh, so I'm expecting about a quarter million dollars of interest revenue next fiscal year. Um, that's assuming that rates stay at where they're at today uh, through the end of the calendar year. If they stay throughout the fiscal year, then that revenue would likely double. Um, again, here's a pie chart with uh, expenditures. So the personnel slice increased, and as well as the cost allocation slice. Uh, personnel costs are expected to go up by just under 9% in the general fund. Uh, this miscellaneous category is going down by quite a bit. Um, we are shifting gears with our marketing efforts. Uh, rather than spending a substantial amount outs or for outside services, those monies are being redirected um, for personnel and for other uh, communication efforts. Uh, the cost allocation is going up uh, and then debt service is going up. Um, we're about to receive our new ladder truck. Um, the city uh, is responsible for the facilities and the equipment of the fire JPA. So this lease payment is ours. And then finally, uh, transfers. So what this represents are monies that we spend on street projects. 
on facilities and on subsidies. Uh, so next fiscal year, we will continue to spend about uh, $2.5 million on street projects. Uh, we're spending a little bit less on facilities, about $500,000 versus the $875,000 we're spending this year. And then there was also a reduction in the amount of subsidies going to other funds. Uh, so overall, um, unfortunately, what we're showing is a deficit um, of about $1.1 million next fiscal year. Um, that is something we need to pay attention to and to come up with a plan to manage it if it gets worse or if we expect more deficits in the future. But because we've been uh, so disciplined the past few years with Measure H, uh, we've actually put ourselves in one of the best financial positions that we've seen uh, in the past decade. So if you go back about 10 years, you can see that uh, the general fund uh, reserve or fund balance back in fiscal year 13 14 was about $2 million, or about 7% of what we spend. Uh, over the course of the next couple of years, it went up to about 20% of general fund expenditures, or about $5 million, or $5.5 million. And then due to COVID, um, a couple revenue streams uh, really took a dive, and we went through a lot of our fund balance and went down to about 9% of uh, expenditures, and then quickly went back up and added about $8.5 million between fiscal year 1920 and uh, fiscal year 22-23. Uh, last year, I brought some uh, budget policies. Uh, one of those policies was a fund balance policy that stated that we should maintain a uh, percent of expenditures of about 25% or four months. So at the end of this fiscal year, we expect to, to exceed that policy level of about and be a, at about 26%. Uh, with that deficit, um, there is a chance that we go below policy. Uh, so as budgeted, um, I would expect fund balance to shrink to about 10 million or about 23% of expenditures. Uh, this would put us out of compliance. Um, if at the end of next fiscal year we had a balanced budget, uh, we would still be at the policy level, but it would shrink rel relative to, to the size of uh, the expenditures. Uh, we could even <clears throat> have a slight deficit next fiscal year and maintain our policy levels. Uh, so at this point, what I would expect is that um, at the mid-year budget, or 24, 25 mid-year, that depending on how we're doing six months in, that we either keep on with the current plan or if, or if things are not looking very good, that I will come back with a plan to help us navigate um, you know, reducing our fund balance even further. Uh, again, I don't think this is a crisis. It's not unusual for the general fund to show a surplus or a deficit, uh, mainly due to our, you know, sales tax revenues. Uh, sales tax goes up and down. That's just how it works. So sometimes the budget's going to be a little healthier than uh, other times. Uh, so on to the last section, the budget study session. Uh, what will be presented at the budget study session? Um, I'll start with Measure H expenditures, and then we will go over departmental budgets, and we will have representatives from each department here to talk about their budget. Uh, we're hoping that this can happen next Tuesday, uh, the 11th at 5 p.m. And one last thing. Um, so if you go to the city's webpage, Might have to share that screen. Um, and you <clears throat> go under my government, we have a link to the proposed budget. So if you follow that link, um, you'll have a number of different options. So last year we acquired a new software product through ClearGov. 
Um, we're currently building out what is called a digital budget book. So as we um, proceed through the month and as we get to budget adoption, um, you will see additional features of this web page. But currently, it does show you budgets by department and division. So you can look at all city departments, and you can drill down into different uh, divisions within those departments. Uh, you can print this out. Uh, we've decided to do that for you and add the PDF. So that's available on that same page. Uh, you can see an FTE, or a full-time equivalent summary. Uh, this shows you changes uh, to personnel by department. And then if you really like budgets, I do have this line item budget. Um, I like it, but most people don't. So, um, And if anyone would like to request a hard copy, um, please just email myself, and uh, we'll get you a hard copy of the budget. Um, it will grow over the next couple of weeks, so you might want to wait. But uh, please try out our new budget tool. That is it. Thank you. So we're receiving a report, but does anybody have any quick questions? Councilmember Moulton? I don't have a question. I just wanted to comment. Um, <laughs> I was going to make fun of you for <laughs> the pedantics. Um, but I just wanted to say, um, sing the praises of that transparency tool. Um, you know, being able to easily access that information in, in kind of organized in multiple different ways that answer a lot of questions for people. So I'm, I'm really glad that was able to be implemented. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Castellano. Are we giving questions and comments Sorry, now? Sorry. I, yeah. I no, you're fine. Okay. We're just it, we're just receiving a report, no, so okay. say what you need. Cool. That's what I thought. I just yeah. was trying to. Okay, I have a few comments and maybe some questions. Um, thank you. Um, let's see. I just want. Uh, yeah, I I really appreciate your work. Um, I just want to express like one concern I have. Um, I'm really appreciative of how much we're valuing our employees, and I just want to. You know, there. <clears throat> I feel like we can't. I, I guess, and I don't think we're necessarily trying to do this, but you know, like this. I just want to express caution or concern in solving our budget challenges by increasing fees, just because there are a lot of people, you know, in the community that. I, and I don't think this is reflective of that, but just to say, like, as we move forward and, you know, and looking at future years, like, if there are continuing to be budget challenges, um, you know, I, I want to caution against increasing fees to solve our budget challenges, um, partially because I just think that there are some people who are doing really well in our community and some people that just means they're going to have less access to mm -hmm. resources, less access to using, you know, city services and things like that. Um, okay. I wasn't, I was like, is Miles going to say no, something? I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, fees are, are cost recovery and that's how we usually try and keep them that way. And, and from a balanced budget standpoint, as you can see from the presentation, our, our fees don't make up a big For portion sure. of our revenue. Great. Thank you for alleviating those concerns. Um, and then I was curious in terms of, you know, I know we have some, like a big emergency operations center that we're working towards. Does this um, create, you know, which again, the, the actual cost is a little yet unknown, but how does this uh, affect our capacity to prepare for that? Um, so since we started receiving Measure H uh, revenues, uh, we've set aside a substantial amount for facilities, and that is embedded in the budget currently. Um, so at some point, we expect that to be translated into the cost of that uh, operations center. And then on top of that, um, there's likely three funds that will bear the majority of the cost of the operations center. Uh, that includes the general fund, obviously, but also water and wastewater. Those are the three main um, operations that utilize or will utilize the new operations center. Okay. 
Great. And do you think there's any capacity, like while we save money for the operation center to invest that money in bonds or anything that we could yield some small interest that would go towards paying for it or yeah essentially all unspent monies right now are being uh, put to work through um, treasury bonds okay great yeah so anything we don't spend it's it's being um, put into these uh, investment vehicles aside from a, a certain amount that we need just to pay the the monthly bills perfect Thank you. I love that. And then um, let's see. I was just curious. You know, I know that this is still a, a long conversation in development, but I just want to say I think that there's some argument to be made for the city of Eureka in terms of um, community benefits and when in terms of like the number of people who will be living here who will be impacted by that industry and supporting that industry. That um, especially some of the things like our you know, wastewater and water systems, I think, could really benefit from, sorry, I didn't even know my phone was on, um, could, you know, really benefit from, um, yeah, just to look at, like, those kinds of investments over time, um, you know, because as, as we all know, those systems continue to age, even as we make improvements toward them. Um, and then, da, 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 da. oh, the zoo revenue, like, what if it doesn't increase? Like, is that when what you're talking about in terms of, like, then we'll reassess and kind of come back with? Yeah, and typically what I do is um, I wait for actuals or I look at the past before I'm willing to up budgets. So typically when I've increased a line item, whether that's a franchise fee or zoo revenue, um, it's because I've seen actual numbers come through. So instead of a lot of cities will just project or they'll, you know, keep the trend going. I'm not comfortable doing that because I've historically seen uh, revenues kind of hit a peak and then go down. And a good example is the zoo. Uh, when we introduced the otter exhibit, uh, we saw record revenues for one fiscal year. And then the following fiscal year or two years out, uh, they went back to normal. So I was very skeptical to uh, increase zoo, re zoo revenues too much, but uh, the proof is kind of in the pudding at this point, and they continue to exceed my expectations. Great. So I'm not I'm not doing it at what I think it will be. I'm doing it at, at a level of, well, they could go down, and we would still meet our budget number. Great. So like we should look for a unicorn or something. No. Um, <laughs> and then uh, one last thing. I was just thinking <laughs> in terms of sales tax revenue. And, you know, I, and I know that folks are working on kind of a shop Eureka campaign and sort of like really bringing people here from out of the area for the holidays and things like that. And so I would love to see us, you know, kind of continue to invest in some of those solutions where we're saying like, well, maybe – we need to, you know, put out a little bit more funding to whatever, you know, light up Eureka or something like that. But in terms of the wins it would have in terms of increasing sales tax revenue and in terms of, you know, like helping support small businesses and really, you know, there's no reason that this couldn't be a destination holiday shopping area for our region. So I would just love for us to kind of be thinking about some of those kinds of things where, like, how can we address that sales tax revenue um, also? So. That, that's all. Thank you. Council Member Contreras Deloge. Yeah, thank you. Um, first and foremost, I, I had a question actually about the, the zoo as well. Um, how, how much of that revenue was taking into account any kind of fundraising on the part of the zoo foundation? Zero. Zero. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I sounded too excited just now, but I just <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, and I think just you know, kind of going along some you know, uh, kind of seconding some of what Councilmember Castellano said. Um, I I guess I'm wondering, um, or you know, I I've I've had this concern because our city is primarily funded on sales tax, and because sales tax has been taking a hit for a while, and I think will continue for a while. Is just kind of how to shore up and make sure that we're, you know, looking out for our employees and then also like what she said, you know, trying to balance and make sure that we're not feeding people to death. Um, I know the recommendation from Cal Cities, their rev taxation revenue has been for us to be really careful about any kind of like 
long-term payment commitments when you're primarily funded off of sales tax. And so I guess I just would say that we just, I think maybe we need to be careful and see how long this is going to persist and last um, with that. Um, I was curious, what was the, um, we talked about the budget for IT going up 80,000 and I was, I, and maybe we can just wait until we get to the 11th to ask that, but I was curious, I wasn't clear on why that was increasing. You'd said some of it was for some programs or something. I, I wasn't clear. Um, well, they'll see uh, increases to personnel costs, but uh, for non-personnel costs, uh, software and uh, cell phone charges, those are the two line items that um, are responsible for most of the increase. Cell phone? Oh, cell phone charge. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm thinking charging, like uh, <laughs> plug in, charges cost. Got it. I'm there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Director Miller. And that takes us to future agenda items. Councilmember Bauer. Excuse me, just one moment. Mm -hmm. We just want to confirm June 11th as the budget study session for everyone. 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay. Yep. It's my job. I need one more for meeting, a quorum. But, uh, <laughs> See what I can do. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you. Would would four p.m. at all be possible or no? Is that like a? a uh, I think from a staff perspective, it it, it could happen. Correct. Uh, it's it's up to council if that Can works for everyone. Four p.m. on the eleventh. Four. Yeah, four p.m. on the eleventh. We do four thirty. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll I'll try to move my board meeting. Haha. <laughs> um, and then so let's maybe keep five. And then if I can't, then maybe we can look at. I'll I'll work on that tomorrow. Very good. No, okay. Yeah. So are we staying with five then? Yeah, we just want to be able to notice it by Wednesday. Oh, wait. Okay. Um, right. This is a special meeting. I, I don't need to. I can oh, notice can it on Thursday. Friday. I yeah. like to give the public as much notice as possible. Right. But okay. Four or five works for me. How, sorry. How long do we think this meeting is going to be? I don't, I'm not trying to be rude at all. I just have to, yeah. I, I mean, it could vary depending on what the council would report. I, I think we'd give each department approximately 10 to 15 minutes to, to present, and I'm sure that Lane would knock his out in about 10 to 15 minutes. So you figure a little over an hour. Okay. Okay. Um, just a note, I don't expect the departments to do a presentation just to be there for questions um, when their budget is presented. And so. that's what I mean by the that would be based on the questions that you guys have. So, you know, I know HR is very interesting, but I don't know how many questions you guys are going to have for HR. Okay. <laughs> so we're good? Yeah. That's, can, can we say 4.30, Scott? I mean, Council Member Bauer, is that okay? Okay. So we're... Right. All right. I will send out a calendar invite tomorrow for 4.30. Okay, future agenda items. Council Member Bauer. It's going to dust off the old request for Greenways and Gulch's ordinance. <laughs> it's, it's been a while since I brought it up. Would love to see that. Sorry, I, what, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, Greenways and Gulch's oh, okay. ordinance. I like the alliteration, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> and what, yeah, what we'll likely do is give an update on this. With new housing laws and stuff like that, there's some certain complex issues that need to be worked out. And so we'll have uh, Development Services Director Kenyon and City Attorney Luna come back with some of those concerns that we have. I can just an answer the question. And um, solutions, of course, excuse yeah. me. 
it's like the streamside management or ordinance that the county has very similar thank you council member malton um i'm afraid i didn't figure out how to articulate this well just yet but i continue to be concerned about even after um some information from staff about our design review committee um, slowing down the process of building affordable housing by kind of stepping outside their bounds. Uh, and I'd like to, we, we had a presentation about moving from um, subjective to more objective um, criteria for building so things can just kind of be checked off rather than going to this board that has their own opinions and potentially their own agenda. So I, um, I'd like to um, ask staff to bring some information about um, the design review committee, uh, their purview, the process by which we choose those folks, and then I'd like to have a public discussion about whether or not we want to continue with that process because design review is under us. So we can decide whether or not we need design review at all and um, if we do, then where we want to put um, boundaries around them because I'm seeing decisions coming down that don't seem to have much to do with design. And um, I'd like to, to look at that and um, just see if that committee is really serving the purpose that was intended with it and if we want to continue with it like it is, um, like it is or make changes to it. Quick question. Do you, do you feel that they're kind of entering the realm of the planning commission or, or something like. Um, I don't know enough about the specific purview of the planning commission to answer that question, but I'm looking at city attorney. Lena. The planning commission has very specific uh, tasks that they perform under the government code. And so design review is a little bit different than that. And as uh, council member Moulton said, we have a lot more control over what those parameters are. And so if uh, council members are interested in learning more about design review uh, and you know what the options are moving forward and what some of the concerns are that uh, council member Moulton has raised, then I think a thumbs up at this point is the appropriate thing to do. Further conversation? Okay. Thank you. Okay, council member Castellano. Um, recently, I heard a presentation by Director Burks of HCOG about some of the things they've been doing, um, and I asked Director Burks if she would be interested in coming before council and, and kind of sharing an update. She said she would, so I'm curious if folks would be interested in hearing more from, from what's up uh, in, in the world of HCOG. And, this, you know, they're doing planning around transit and housing and, and things like that. That's Humboldt County Association of Governments, in case you were wondering there. All right. Moving on to city manager reports, the EPD homeless survey with Commander Yes, LaFrance. thank you, Mayor, and good evening again, Mayor and Council. So tonight we have Commander LaFrance here to give a report. This is um, the fourth um, report that um, EPD has worked on. They've uh, since 2018. They've been doing um, much more in-depth surveys of um, our community members experiencing homelessness um, than what the county does for the point in time count. The county does a very um, precursory review of of individuals and make estimates and those type of things. This is much more of a um, meet them where they're at, have discussions with them, ask for more in-depth information so that we can evaluate not only our um, CSET response, but also our social services response to those community members. So take it away, Commander LaFrance. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, good evening, Council Mayor. Uh, yeah, this is our, our fourth uh, fourth homeless survey we've uh, we've brought forward since 2018. Uh, we're conducting every two years. Uh, the last time we presented this survey was actually during COVID. Uh, we missed the 2022 presentation. Um, last time presented it was over Zoom. I think it was in my office somewhere. So it's been a, it's been a little bit. 
Uh, so purpose and intent, there's, we can go off on this for a while, but again, we're trying to get an understanding of the foundation of what our homeless population looks like. So um, and once we have a general understanding, what are the needs they have and how do we fill those needs? It also, when we look at the survey, it's 30, now 38 questions. It was originally 18 questions, I believe, uh, under Chief Watson. We put a lot more questions into it, um, and people do it, definitely answer them. Um, but it also gives a lot of our newer employees that aren't as embedded with our homeless uh, as CSET is and has been over the past six, uh, six years uh, of, of, of being around. Um, it gives them a chance to really ask questions to get to know people as well. And so it, it, you'll, see, you'll see some of the questions. Uh, some people are shocked that how in the world will our homeless community members talk to the cops? Um, by far, when you, I, I believe I sent the raw data out to all the council and the uh, city clerk, um, but by far our CSET led the way and, and they got more than half the surveys uh, because they know the people, they know them by name. Um, we asked them very like detailed questions about drug use, about their life, are, there, are they satisfied? And we get very honest answers um, because again, that, that human connection that, that they've made for years, um, you just can't, you can't dismiss that. And it's why our programs are so successful. Obviously, some other purpose and intent is we use this data a lot when we look at funding our programs like CARE, uh, Uplift, uh, CSET. Um, of course, if folks aren't familiar, uh, a lot of the homeless money comes through Sacramento, straight to the county, not straight to the cities where most of our homeless population lives, which is challenging. Uh, therefore, we have to apply for money uh, from the county um, against other organizations and the county itself to actually get this money to run our programs, such as CARE and Uplift. Um, so it's, it has a bigger purpose as well. So it's kind of multifaceted. So here's how the survey works. Uh, we run a four week sample. Uh, so this year was March 10th to April 6th. It's usually the first week of March to the first week of April. So it's a four week sample. Uh, as, as the city manager pointed out, the point of time count is one night. Um, and it's not an individual survey. It's a, it's a guesstimation. Um, it can be, hey, I see a vehicle with, it looks like it holds six people. They write six down. Uh, for us, it's here's an individual we get a name, um, we actually go through all the information. People can refuse to answer the questions, it's not work forcing them to do this. Um, but again, we're getting a, a much more detailed, uh, individualized answers and a much bigger picture over a full month versus one single morning for a couple hours. So personnel uses uh, CSET Care and Uplift, that's been the traditional. Uh, this was the first year I have not been involved on the streets of doing the survey. I was just, a, uh, as a CSET sergeant, I managed it and also went out and did surveys. Uh, now as the commander uh, overseeing uh, CSET, I'm just overseeing it and didn't get a chance to go out and talk with my folks on the streets. And we use uh, SurveyMonkey, makes it really easy, uh, especially for my, uh, my, my homeless outreach worker friends that don't like technology, uh, so it makes it really easy for... Uh, um, they're phenomenal, but technology is not, not always their friend, but Survey Monkey they can definitely do. So, And then we do it in person. Uh, we actually talk to people in person uh, to get the actual, uh, the actual results. So in total, there's 38 questions. Uh, that includes name and then also location uh, and also uh, who actually, what uh, employee took the survey or gave the survey. Uh, responses are to each question are self-reported. So if we engage one of our clients that we know is a mental health issue, we put them on a 5150 hold, uh, we know they have a diagnosis, but if we ask them a question, have you ever been diagnosed or treated for a mental health condition? If they say no, for the survey, we put no. That's just how surveys work. So we know the data is always not gonna be completely perfect. That's not how, it's, how this works. We recognize that there's gonna be some plus and minor uh, percent errors. But again, this is a, a good overall view when we look at this. Uh, most questions are open-ended, and then if you look at our numbers for surveys, uh, you hear a lot of various numbers for how many, how big our homeless population is here, right? You hear everything from like 750 to 1,000, um, which would, which I, working the streets for many years, uh, I've never seen that many numbers. Uh, we also look at numbers from free meal every month, how many they serve, how many meals they serve per day, per person, and so our numbers are generally in the same ballpark um, as our community partners. So in 2018, 190, uh, 20, 2020, 205, uh, 2022 to 249 and last year we had two uh, this year we had 221 sometimes we have duplicate surveys so um, i'm the only one myself and lorman tagna the admin tech for cset are the only ones that can actually access the raw data um, otherwise it's completely confidential and so we can actually remove uh, duplicate surveys if they come in because some of our individuals they don't remember they took a survey three hours ago and they'll still complete a new survey and we give nothing out for the uh, to do a survey we just conduct them and do our uh, CSET and uplift and care do their normal outreach 
So first thing we ask is for age. Uh, this has been pretty consistent across the board. Um, 35 to 44 years old is pretty in that ballpark. Obviously, from 45 to 49 uh, went up a fair amount this year as well. Um, we saw a, young, a little bit younger, 1824 came in. Um, but historically, the biggest majority of numbers we've seen, um, and you can see obviously the gold for 2024 and 2022 in white, uh, our biggest majority is still going to be the 35 to 44 year olds with the 45 to 49 creeping in. But we saw the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, bevel or V pattern um, over the past four years of doing this. Uh, not, much has, not a lot has changed uh, in the data we're receiving um, year to year on this, or every two years. Uh, gender, same thing. Uh, it's usually a seven to three ratio. That's pretty consistent across the country. Uh, seven males to three females are homeless. And then uh, we often look at this number for our compared to our population. This is about correct for us. 84% uh, are Caucasian or white. Uh, Native American was a concern we had last year or two years ago. We had, I believe, around 13% uh, reported being Native American. Uh, we work with our tribal partners. Um, we work a lot with the Yurok tribal. Uh, they have a new uh, Kelly Johnson, who is the was a pro senior program manager for the county, uh, now works for Yurok tribal, and I work with her very closely. Uh, and we were really trying to get, uh, if someone's Native, uh, we try to get them connected back with, the, uh, with their entity uh, for support. And that seems to be working fairly well. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the data we see here matches our alignment with actually what we have as a total population for, uh, for race. Uh, household family status, most people are single. Uh, that's consistent across the board. We've seen that for, since 2018. If you look on the bottom, uh, very bottom, it says uh, incompet or incomprehensible. So this is a good uh, thing to look at when we're talking about mental health or drug use. So if people, if I ask, hey, what color is the wall? And they say alien, um, that if it's, if it's not in the realm at all of the, of the question, we can put it down as incomprehensible. And so as you look at this, you'll see the incomprehensible numbers go up and down. And um, that's also, it's a, to me, it's a good balance in looking at really what is, what are the challenges we face mental health wise in our community uh, with this population. And that usually fluctuates from between two and 10% depending uh, on the question. Uh, who do you live with? Most people, again, they're single, so they live alone. Uh, some people have a, a partner or pets. Um, we often talk about challenges uh, for housing individuals is having a partner, having a pet. Um, so that's still uh, strong and proven for, with this uh, survey again. We're not seeing many children on the street, which is good. If we do see children, um, Officer Clark, who's our missed officer, uh, our mental health officer, she is quick to act and get them connected with services very, very quickly. Uh, we've seen probably more children probably over the past year with families. Uh, but again, it, we've been, I should say, CSET's been very, very quick to act to get them connected um, with either uh, housing with child welfare or, and or uh, often Betty is usually a key, uh, key partner for us. We don't like seeing kids in the street. Uh, education wise, uh, most have high school diplomas. And we had uh, one individual had uh, graduate work, a report having graduate work. And monthly income, more than half make zero a month. So when we look also to the 1,000 to 1,500, the average rent here in I believe Humboldt County right now is around, I think it's either 14 or, I would say the numbers confused are backwards. It's either 1,057 a month or $1,400 a month. Um, so if you're making social security at 954 a month, you cannot afford to pay rent. And that's a common problem we've seen across um, with these surveys. And that'll later show in um, some of the other additional questions we, we ask about barriers to um, why the reason why they're not housed. So last time employed, uh, actually a fair amount were employed within the past year, which is actually pretty good. And a very, very small percent have been never employed. It's only 4% reported that, being never employed. Obviously, if some of the 4% for like 20 plus years, those are probably some more, more hard cases with mental health and addiction. Uh, military service, we constantly hear there's so many vets in the street. That's absolutely not true. Um, we rarely see veterans on the street. If they are in the street, uh, we at least CSET and, and Uplift Care immediately connect them with the VA or Nation's Finest, other resources. There's lots of resources for veterans. So if, if you are seeing people fly signs saying they're a veteran, it is likely they are um, 
they could have gone through boot camp, but they didn't actually graduate boot camp, or they may have served but then discharged um, other than uh, honorably. Um, but most of them, if you're seeing that, is probably there's probably a reason why that they're not being supported by the VA. But for the most part, most of our veterans that we're seeing in the city of Eureka can't speak of other cities, but our city, they are definitely being supported uh, by the VA and other entities for veterans. Where did you sleep last night? Uh, the mission's being a lot, uh, used a lot more uh, this over the past couple of years. We've seen that um, even with talking with uh, Brian Hall, the executive director at the mission, and Kristen, Hans uh, Kristen uh, Freeman from the, uh, from the family shelter. Uh, so we are seeing those shelters utilized much more often. Um, I know there's, there's still beds available at the men's side. The women's and family side is always a little more challenging. Uh, they are upgrading, obviously, but it, we're seeing a lot more people use shelters versus um, necessarily being outside. It's still not good enough. We need to do better. But again, we've seen a significant increase in that. Uh, how long How long have you been homeless for? So one or two years right now is the, is the leading. Uh, we're, we are seeing some, some younger people on the street or some fresh people. And we'll talk about locations in a little bit where they're coming from. Um, but that's a general idea of uh, how long have you, have you been homeless for? How long have you been humble, right? We hear a lot of stories about we have brand new people here all the time. 25% of our homeless, one out of four, have been born and raised here. 37% uh, have been here more than 20 years. So we have some very, very vetted people that have been here for a long time in our community, more than 20 years. Um, again, less than one year, 15%. Not saying number is great, but again, we're just not seeing, we are seeing new faces. I was down at Free Meal last week, and I'm again, I'm out there all the time, but uh, I saw a lot of new faces. Um, but again, some of our clients that have been here for a long time are still out there, and they've been here since I've started 17 years ago. Uh, why'd you come to Humboldt? So if they weren't from Humboldt, we ask why, and it's commonly a, a friend or family um, or late relationship that brought him here, brought them here to Humboldt County. Better life is the new answer we had. Um, so anytime we have it, we have open-ended questions, we have an other category, uh, which allows the person uh, conducting the survey to actually fill in a name or fill in a, a phrase or whatever the answer is. And so then we take those, those others and we actually categorize them after the fact. And so better life was actually one of the categories we created um, after the, open, the, the other uh, answers we received. Uh, Where did you live prior to becoming homeless? Most of our homeless are from Eureka. They're, they are from here. Uh, otherwise, looking at other states and other uh, counties in California, other locations in Humboldt County, and then some of the other cities. So let's talk about where they're coming from. Uh, Redding's number one place. We had nine people come from Redding, four from Shasta, uh, nine from Oregon, five from Washington. Uh, interestingly enough, we're actually working. An individual was brought here from Shasta last the past couple weeks. Past couple weeks ago, we've been having lots of issues with. Um, He's brought here to be in a, going to program. It, it wasn't didn't pan out, and so we were talking with those folks in Shasta to um, make sure we get the individual back home or where he should be because he's causing a lot of issues in our community. And that's just we're trying to take care of the folks we have right now, and um, we're trying to avoid adding uh, more to the population. But for some reason, Reading and Shasta has been the the top two places we're seeing people come over from. So why are you homeless? Uh, family situations the biggest one we're seeing from this survey: uh, unemployment or lost their income. Uh, evicted or loss of housing. It, during COVID, we housed a lot of people. Uh, we were, I remember being out there with our case managers from MIST and with Uplift and getting people housed constantly. Um, if they met a certain score, we had places for them. We'd be out searching in the mornings to get them, uh, make their appointment, pick them up and drive them over there. We saw a lot of people get, um, get in housing. The challenge with this population is when you house them, if you don't support them, they're going to lose housing um, because they're often not able to care for themselves. Uh, they're not able to you know, live in a, a structured facility um, using use a restroom or use a kitchen or keep their apartment clean. And so they need a lot more support. Uh, and we see that across the board with our housing programs as well. 7% say choice. And we'll see that question later, later pop up. Uh, periods of homelessness in their life. So the majority have been homeless once in their life. Again, I, I can technically break the data down and say, hey, out of the People have been homeless once in their life. How long have they been homeless? What's the average? Um, I haven't broke that down yet. We can. We can filter a lot of data out. Uh, but the largest majority of people have been homeless once. And then uh, almost 20% have been homeless six or more times. And those are like, those are folks that obviously go homeless, get in housing, or some form of housing, get, get, get either evicted or come out and back and forth. 
And we can probably look at that data also for substance use reporting and then mental health reporting as well. Uh, are you satisfied with your current life? 61% said no, 16% said yes, and 11% said neither. So 27% are in that yes and neither category, almost a third. And then seven refused to answer the question. But only six out of, six out of 10 are saying that they, they are not satisfied. Is your lifestyle a matter of choice? 33% said yes. This has been consistent throughout, throughout since uh, 2018. We've ranged anywhere from 30 to 40% uh, with this is a, a lifestyle of choice, which makes it challenging when you're trying to assist people into housing or to employment. Um, it makes it very challenging when people are willingly doing this uh, and saying, this is my choice to do this. Now, granted, there's probably some mental health on board. There's some substance use on board um, that correlate to that. Um, but again, we're seeing that number consistently across the board for six years um, with 30, 40% saying, yes, this is a, a lifestyle of choice. Uh, do you have a chronic health problem or physical disability? Uh, same thing we've seen more than half the population report having that. Uh, we also, we detailed some other questions about um, dental and some other, some other uh, more detailed about that. Um, which we, we also have, we can get results on as well. But again, more than half are reporting chronic health problems are, are physical uh, health conditions. So it's definitely a challenging uh, population to, to work with and to get support. Uh, diagnosed or treated for a mental health disorder or medication or medicated for that, 48%, uh, same as last two years ago, said yes. We know this number is low um, because a lot of, uh, I won't go off because I'll, I'll let Jacob with, uh, with care talk about uh, th why we have these numbers. Um, he's not here tonight, don't worry. Uh, but there's reasons why the number's low. Um, but still, if you go down to free meal, if you spend an hour down there uh, with staff, um, you'll definitely see more than 48% of the population have some type of mental health disorder. That's still significant because they, when you look at pop, uh, overall across the country, I believe they say 20% of homeless have mental health disorders. We're seeing 48% here, self-reported. Uh, where do you go when you're sick or injured? Of course, St. Joe's, right? That's the most popular place. Um, that's why we work so hard with them to, especially with mental health holds, to really help them to, if, to ensure we're not overcrowding the ER, we don't have to, and making sure our officers and case managers and clinicians are diverting away from holds if possible, because um, St. Joe's really gets overloaded. Uh, we divert a lot of people also for medical problems to open door. They're at Free Meal and Betty's uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I believe. So they've, they've been a great partner, and their numbers are obviously up for their mobile uh, their mobile van. Uh, visited ER in the past 12 months. Uh, about a third did not visit at all. And then you have six or more times, 12%. So that's, uh, again, we can, if we ask more questions about that, my guess would be um, winter time, we see more people go to the ER uh, to get inside. They'll say, hey, I'm suicidal, I'm something else. And it's, it's kind of, it often appears to staff that they're trying to get inside to stay warm, which we'd rather they just come say, hey, we want to we get warm somewhere. We'll actually connect with a resource versus, uh, versus going to the ER because the ER can have up to 50 people, 70 people in the waiting room. Um, they're a very busy place. And then they have 20 to 20 beds technically, and they can open up to 30 beds if needed. Uh, what health insurance do you have? So most have Medi-Cal, Medicare and partnership has really come into being. Don't ask me questions on these because I'm not an expert about healthcare. Uh, drugs are all, all called been a problem in your life. 59% said, yes, it has been a problem in their life. This has been across the board. Uh, when we asked this question six years, uh, around 60% say substance use has been an issue in my life. And again, 7% refused to answer the question. My guess would be that 7% would probably add into the yes category. We break this down. Uh, we actually ask, you know, what, okay, we ask the question, well, what drugs? So methamphetamine right now is the highest used drug by our homeless population, followed by alcohol, uh, marijuana, fentanyl, heroin, uh, prescription medication, crack cocaine, and then others. Uh, for sure, we've seen a decrease in heroin over the past couple of years. I, I haven't, I think I've seen heroin once in the past 18 months probably, um, but fentanyl or Fetty, it's everywhere. Uh, we had an OD today, we have ODs all the time. It's very, very common. And we'll talk about fentanyl here in a second. But methamphetamine, if you're a, uh, for historically for males, alcohol is the number one drug of choice, followed by meth, but for females, uh, it's methamphetamine and then alcohol. That's been pretty consistent across the board for several years. Uh, how often do you use alcohol? So, um, 
half said never. They don't use alcohol at all. And then on occasion was the second highest answer, 21% or one out of five. My guess is the daily drinkers. We know we, we definitely have some folks that drink a lot um, all the time. Uh, we know them quite often. Uh, they go to jail quite a bit. Um, but there are definitely some heavy, heavy drinkers that drink every single day. And they probably operate at a very, very high blood alcohol um, rate. Uh, methamphetamine, uh, daily use about one out of five are using daily. And then about half said they never use it. And again, this is self-reported. So uh, when we get to fentanyl, we'll talk about stigma within the community itself. So heroin, drastic decrease. Um, heroin's expensive. Fentanyl's cheap. Uh, it flows into the, into the state and it's accessible. And it's, we're seeing it in various kinds of drugs across the board. Uh, but heroin's expensive or it's more costly than fentanyl. And so we're not seeing it. It's not flooding the country or into the state. So fentanyl. So about one out of 10 are saying these uh, daily. Um, this historically heroin was like the drug. If you're homeless or you're using drugs, you do not admit to using. There's a stigma. Uh, there is a hierarchy within our homeless community, there within the, the dr uh, drug use community, that there's, these are the drugs are okay to use. These are the ones not okay to use. And you never admit you use these drugs. It's just how the stigma works within that. And so we saw that with heroin before, uh, and now we're seeing it with fentanyl. Um, my, my guess would be we're see, uh, with the OD rates we're seeing and how many ODs we go to, uh, my guess is we're having more people use daily than one out of 10. And then again, 9% refuse to answer the question. So to me, that's telling that it's probably around 20% 20, 20 if not higher. How often use marijuana? 40% use it daily. It's not shocking com uh, considering the county we live in um, and how, how easy marijuana is to access and very similar to alcohol. Um, it's a very, very easy to use. We often come across people smoking uh, marijuana in public, which you still cannot do, um, but it's a very, very common thing we, we see our homeless population using. Uh, how, how many times have you been treated for alcohol or drug abuse? So uh, about 40% or 45% have never been treated for, for drug use. One, uh, yes, one to five times. They've been to rehab one to five times is about 40%. So I believe the latest data on if you want, if you are having a, if you have a substance use disorder and you're wanting it clean, it's going to take you 20 plus times to go to rehab. 1% of our homeless population has gone to rehab 20 plus times. So again, that's, that's just the current number. Um, it used to be, I think, with 7 to 13, it keeps increasing along the way. I'm not sure why that is, but that's what we're seeing. How do you support yourself? Uh, one out of five say they don't. Then public assistance, another one out of five. Uh, SSI or SSDI. Again, they're, if they're getting full SSI, uh, you're getting 954 a month, which obviously does not cover the cost of rent. A and also just general living, getting food, um, whatever else. We did see the we had we actually have a category for crime or theft actually went thing went down this year compared to 2022. So people would ask me, how do you you know get money? Support yourself. I steal. It's an answer they'll tell the cops, um, but that's how some people were getting uh, getting money. Uh, Panhandling is also down this year as well. And you're receiving the following and the, any of the following benefits: so food stamps, that's the obvious that's been the highest historically, uh, and then it trails down from there from Social Security, General Relief, some get none at all, and then SSDI. And again, these are all top top responses. If I put all of them, all of them in here. Uh, we wouldn't have room. So there's a lot of services available for individuals. Uh, what prevents you from using public assistance? Um, almost one out of five said they're using all that are available. And then some people say, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. And then we, we broke it down to lack of knowledge, uh, how to apply, where to apply. Uh, some people say nothing. I just don't want it. I don't want it. And then what resources are you using? This is important for us because this is a category where we look at where we're going to place our homeless outreach workers. Where do we want uh, CSET, like for Officer Clark, when she's available to, to spend most of her time? Um, because, again, we want to target outreach to, we, to the masses. Um, we want to go out also in the field in various locations. But if we can hit, go to free meal and encounter, engage positively with 150 homeless individuals that are there eating or low-income folks or people that are struggling and make that connection, um, then that's a good strategy to have. So free meal has been the number one uh, across the board. That's the, I, I believe it's the, based on our data, it's the number one hub in the city of Eureka. It is likely the number one hub in the county of Humboldt um, for service, uh, followed by the mission. And then open door, food for people, uplift, uh, Hatcher, and then Betty. We've seen a decrease with Betty. Um, 
but again, we know Betty's housing a lot of people and is working with a lot of people to get them uh, where they need to go. Um, she's been a key partner for us, but we've seen that uh, decrease with that. But again, free, yeah, free meals where, where our, most of our, our, our outreach staff is spending time, and they should. Uh, what resources, services, or opportunities do you need? Uh, most people want a place to live, right? That's a, probably a no-brainer, but they want a place to live. Uh, obviously, money. Dental care was one that popped up. I know it's been an issue even for folks that are housed. It's dental care across the board. Uh, laundry services. Uh, we've talked about different strategies for that, including like mobile laundry stations or how do we make this happen. Um, but otherwise, uh, the other ones stay fairly consistent. Bathrooms always pop up. That I need for bathrooms. Those obviously those are always challenging. Um, historically, they've been very very challenging to implement those programs. Uh, biggest barriers for overcoming, uh, for obtaining housing, uh, lack of affordable housing. Again, if you're making nine fifty four a month and rent is fourteen hundred or even thousand fifty dollars a month, you're not going to be able to pay for rent and survive. Uh, lack of income, uh, lack of employment, uh, upfront cost, lack of rental history, credit issues, assistance with paperwork, uh, mental health issues. So, luckily, the good news is a lot of those programs with through Uplift, we're we're working on those um, in assistance out with care and and CSET. We're kind of funneling funneling through over to Uplift. So we actually have a lot of these uh, gaps we're able to fill. Even though the numbers are still there, um, we are able to, especially things like assistance with paperwork. I know that we, many times we've helped fill, people fill out applications for, for rentals and then pan them over to, uh, to Jeff at Uplift and Robert and Larry and have them work the other things that are the gap fills that we have to have. Par pardon me, Commander LaFrance. I, th I think we need to make a motion to extend the meeting. Well, thank you. I'm just not on my game, am I? I was so enthralled with your presentation. So yes, we do need to get. An, uh, <laughs> we do need to have a motion to extend the meeting. Who's in? Sure, <laughs> I'll move to extend the meeting to ten o'clock, just to give us plenty of time, more time than we need. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Aye. Unanimous yes vote. Motion carries. Thank you. Councilmember Castellano. All right, so we have a lot of time for the last uh, the last question. Uh, so, so, what's the biggest barrier for obtaining employment? So, for the folks that we talked to, um, the physical disabilities or health issues that was the biggest. Uh, transportation is another one. Uh, mental health issues again, it's popping up across the board. Again, if you spend a little bit of time embedded with this population, it's obvious um, that there's mental health issues going on. Uh, not having housing, so you go to work in the daytime, you have no place to go at nighttime to sleep, get clean, and get ready for work the next, uh, the next day. Uh, some didn't know why. And then appearance, uh, so for clothing, hygiene, no place to, again, wash clothes for laundry. Um, and then some people have criminal record, so one, almost one out of ten um, have a criminal record, therefore they, it prevents them from getting certain employment. And then gaps, uh, gaps in hist employment history. Again, a lot, of these, a lot of this data is why some of the programs we have through Uplift, same thing with uh, Pathway to Payday, um, when we have you know clothing hygiene, we work with Betty to obviously get people uh, those, uh, those needs as well. Um, but again, we're trying to strategize on the programs we have and how, we, how do we fill these gaps along the way. Uh, the good news is, well, not good news, but the good news is, is that we're seeing consistency across the past six years. And so at least as we're building our programs up, um, we're kind of hitting the, the, tar the, the issues we're having, kind of dropping those down. Um, and again, we've only been operational for CSET for six years, Uplift for probably six years also. Wow, for adults, yeah. So but for you know, outreach workers, four years, and then with CARES, uh, just brand new, uh, what, almost two years now. Um, so I mean, the programs are still really new, and you know, four years from now will be 10 years in. And so as we, as we are looking, to projecting the future, uh, the goal would be to hit the, the things that we can resolve. We want to resolve those issues. Um, and again, using the data is important for us. Um, and I can answer questions. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Council Member Bauer. Um, wow. There's a lot to digest there, Commander LaFrance. And thank you to you and your and all the um, staff that worked on this because it's it's an incredibly as you can see complicated issue um, I, I I'm not sure how many people are actually still watching I hope a bunch but 
is this available to the public? Will this be on our website, this presentation? We can definitely make that happen. What we'll likely do, um, we haven't done this in the past, but we could definitely put out some social media mm -hmm. on it and then post it on the website um, somewhere so that people have it. Because it does dispel a lot of, you know, you hear all the time that, you know, where do all these people come from? And it's been pretty consistent that um, the vast majority of them are our community members that have been here for a long time. Yeah, and we, and we, like, we can also, we have the raw data we can actually... Um, produce actually it removes all of the any confidential information it just gives more of the responses that you saw and some graphs so we can i don't see why we can't do that that'd be great and then um another question I, you know you hear people talk about oh uh people are brought in involuntarily like essentially they're trucked here and um i've heard it a couple of times from people i'm like nah, no i don't think so but was that a question that we ask or do we know has is that ever happened where people have been brought in, you know, basically put on a bus and, and dropped off here. It it has. Again, with the survey, we asked, you know, uh, why did you come to Humboldt County or why did you come to Eureka? And so that's why we had, the, you know, the Reading was number one, Shasta's number two, and then Oregon's number one for statewide. Um, we have an instant instances over the past several years where we're having people just, where, hey, here's a bus ticket, go to Eureka. Again, we had the issue this past week where we're working on resolving right now. Um, you know, so say if we have an individual for, I can only speak for our end of how we do things, but if we have an individual that wants to go back home to family, we actually, uh, our teams work talk to the family directly, uh, Google addresses. We make sure that if we if we help this person get back home to family, it is a complete package. We're not dumping them off to another community. And so that we're, we, we've been very successful. We haven't done that a lot. We've been successful when we have um, to get people either back to their family or to, we have an individual right now back in Kansas who's working two jobs. He has an apartment. He updates uh, our admin tech Montagna uh, with photographs of how he's doing. It's, you know, it's amazing to see because he was probably a 200 plus calls per year for service for EPD. And now we got him back home a couple of years or a year and a half ago um, and had a good plan. But we are we are definitely seeing folks brought over here. You know, as an example, the individual last week was brought over by, we believe, with social services from that that part of the, of the, of the state and supposed to go in a program. Well, there's no room in the program for him when they got here. And so for us, we wouldn't, our goal would be, hey, mission, we're going to send him to you confirm he got with you yes we, we have him um, he's in our care now and so we make sure we're going from point a to point z because we don't want to dump our uh, dump other our our people off on other communities thanks again appreciate it councilmember fernandez yeah, thank you uh yeah th this is very comprehensive so thank you for that and i know you'd said that there's still some work to be done or, or look over in reviewing the raw data and so i'm curious just about a few things that you may not have answers to because of the need to look over some of that uh, going back to some of the numbers there for the folks that have lived in humboldt for about 20 or more years that was about a third maybe just a little over and i'm curious if we're able to connect what it is uh, that they experienced that brought them into homelessness or pushed them into that uh, would you happen to know that, or is that good? I, I definitely don't know off the top right, of my head, right, yeah. but I can I can go into uh, into the survey and actually filter the information out, so it's fairly it's fairly easy to do. Okay, and and then going to the folks that, uh, and I am happy to see that more more of them are utilizing the uh, the shelters, but but of the folks that slept in an encampment or a vehicle or a sidewalk, that's still almost the same amount. Did they? Do you know why those particular folks? We're in that particular situation. Do you know that one off the top of your head? I definitely do not. Okay, um, yeah. So a lot of the stuff I'm probably going to want is going to be more niche then. <laughs> yeah, it, we can filter uh, the questions we have. We can filter out and actually get, and you know, I can filter out just for, you know, people that stayed in the you know, in the encampment. I can filter all the answers out for that and look at the data and actually give graphs for that as well. Okay. Yeah, and I think it goes back to what uh, uh, Council Member Bauer w was saying and even uh, hinted at by the uh, city manager here is that this does and would dispel a lot of what we hear about why folks may be homeless in this community. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenges with the survey, we originally started working on this, I worked on creating this 38 question survey based on just research on other entities and other surveys. Um, and we could have gone down a lot of rabbit holes. Like we would love to put ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences questions in here. Um, but that had, had 10 more questions. And we're looking at a 12 minute survey and some of our you know members of our, of our homeless community, they you know, 12 minutes is a long time. Um, and so we're trying to balance out getting data, um, but also I would love to go down more rabbit holes. Um, it just gets challenging because I could, 
probably think of a hundred questions to ask people. Um, but yeah, but we're always looking at in the future and, you know, two years from now, um, at least modifying or adding questions as needed and then removing questions if we don't need them. Council member Castellano. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, as other council members have expressed, thank you. And um, yeah, I, there's definitely an interest in seeing how some of this data correlates, you know, across questions and things like that, especially things, well, many, many especially, but one of the things that came up is just, you know, like, oh, for pe you know, the 22% who have been employed in the past year, you know, like, where, where were they employed? What kind of employment? What, you know, like, might those be opportunities? And then, you know, just the relationship between fentanyl use and, you know, homelessness. Definitely interested to learn more. It's startling, um, but, you know, appreciate it. Um, and, I, and so I think a, kind of a larger question is just um, a two-part question. Like, w it seems like there are so many opportunities to kind of use this data to then, like, drill down into, like, okay, how can we, through some of our other programming, support specific people? And I know at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, there were, there were kind of folks who were making kind of like, like targeted approaches to, to work with people who are unhoused of saying like, okay, you know, like we're going to focus on these 10 people who are, I, I could be totally going off the rails. Okay. Um, you know, focus on these 10 people who are either get, like getting more calls for service or maybe there's more opportunities to connect them back into work or housing and things like that. Are those approaches still happening? So under, uh, with CSET, when we started CSET, we, uh, as a sergeant, I would, we'd have a list of 10 individuals that were a primary causing significant calls for service. Uh, and so we'd actually either, we would obviously use enforcement or, 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 uh, engagement with them depending on what how how willing they were to to engage with us for services but yeah um currently under sergeant omi i think he's doing five uh, a list of five right now um, the challenge again with cset they went from five officers to three and they're also covering patrol so it's been a challenge for them to um get br a broader picture when we had cset back in 2018 19 20 there was five of us uh, plus we had robert and larry uh, with up with uplift and so even during COVID, i mean we were able to do get a lot done um, but th when they drop to three to five, that's been definitely challenging uh, for them. Um, so 10 may be a little bit for them right now, but yeah. that's, the goal would be to get have a list of uh, 10 people we can target outreach with. And without going into a lot of detail or politics, I mean, whatever, we're, we're in politics, but, um, you know, I guess I'm kind of curious because this seems like it would be so useful to some of our other community partners who are doing outreach work to to also you know maybe sort of refine their efforts or you know is this data being utilized by other folks with success or you know because clearly we have limited staff but there are other government entities etc that have more staff yeah so historically we've shared it with our partners so i believe the missions use it for grants i know for sure uh, free meal or it, technically, St. Vincent de Paul free dining facility. They've definitely used it. Uh, we work with uh, Bob Santelli, who's one of their very active board members. Uh, we share the data with him. We've, we've helped um, give data in support uh, for grant writing for them as well. Uh, I believe Salvation Army used the data. Uh, Betty's obviously uses the, the data. So we're definitely willing to share the, uh, the data. We share it with the county. Um, we often present to uh, Director Beck with uh, DHHS. Um, the data. So it's up to them. If they want to use it, they can use it. Um, we're not going to try to hide the data. We're going to very openly use this is the data we have. This is what we're seeing in our community. Thank you. Councilmember Malkin, you can have a... Thank you. You have to call my name. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's in the rules. Um, thank you, Officer LaFrance. I really appreciate this thorough report and the work that you're doing to gather the data, um, having data to, to drive our programs just really um, makes me feel more confident about their long-term efficacy. And thank you for doing this work. I think the fact that you value the, um, the human connection, and I did homeless outreach work around here specific to youth for many years, and that um, just having that, that connection with people um, can be difficult to do <laughs> and it can cost a lot of the people that are doing it uh, especially as you say when you're talking to folks and you can clearly see that they are suffering 
um, from mental illness and might be resistant to um, getting help for that, which leads me to my question, uh, which it may be one of those you don't have a crystal ball questions about um, measure A and the change in the way that um, folks can be helped when they are resistant to that. You don't know yet? No. Okay. Um, Thank you. That wasn't measure A, was it? I'm mixing up my measures. Prop one. Was it prop one? One was about moving money around. The other one was about who can and can't be made to engage in services when they don't want to. Yeah, so referring to SB 43. Yeah. Thank uh, you. So in I believe the uh, managing mental health clinician Rosen presented for that. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think that's going to be, uh, I spoke on this at a conference a couple of days ago down in Santa Rosa, and it's going to be challenging um, with SB 43, the change to gravely disabled. Uh, so in theory, that changes a lot of things. But again, it, it talks about substance use disorder being a criteria for gr- gravely disabled. Mm-hmm. So right now, if we have, let's, let's estimate based on the data we have, we have 250 to 350 homeless in Eureka. That's probably a good general number. Um, so we take 60% admit to having a SUD problem. Do the math real quick. Um, do we have that many beds at St. Joe's to fill up? Mm-mm. Um, yeah, the answer is absolutely not. So, um, obviously we've been taking an approach to make sure we're educating our officers when it is implemented in 2026, I believe that's when we have it. Um, we've diverted it until 2026, I believe for the County. Uh, we've been working on efforts to make sure officers are educated on, Hey, this is, this is available to you. However, um, this is not the first uh, step forward. And our, our officers have been very, very good about, um, mental health calls, um, we continually receive recognition, a, a patrol, CSET across the board from the county and our community partners um, on their ability to divert away from the ERs, um, which again are just flooded and just to connect people with services. So, um, And as for Prop 1, I don't know. We'll see. It's going to take away money from um, the Mental Health Act um, and divert it away. But again, that, that'll open up opportunity for the city to get um, funding, in my opinion, to, for programs like CARE. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes for, yeah. there's a reason we have our own program for mental health. We want that. We want low barrier. We want to streamline services. We want no red tape or limited red tape. And so that at least allows us to get that, that funding for our, our teams that work directly with us. So when it's three in the morning and I give a call to a clinician or case manager, um, they're going to answer their phone and be able to respond out if we need them. And that's really what our community needs is that 24 seven availability um, to, to care for people. And that's not currently how the system works right now. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, just one more comment. Um, I happened to come across uh, a person in distress uh, being detained in the wild the other day. I was just heading into a grocery store and uh, saw someone shouting, um, why am I being detained? Am I being detained? And uh, I stopped and paid attention to that because I heard that. And I watched the officers um, very calmly and very respectfully talk to this person who then started clearly shouting about things that were not happening or in reality. And I was really impressed, not surprised, but impressed by the way that the officers handled themselves and that person. There's plenty of people around. Um, you know, they were very difficult and, uh, they, to my lay opinion, were being treated, um, with empathy. And I know that that's, uh, that's the goal. So I just wanted to, um, say good job. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Good question. Council member Contreras still out? Mainly, I just wanted to say thank you. I really, um, as always, you're a wealth of information, and I really appreciate like how thorough you are, and just also that really almost any question that we're gonna throw, you've got you know a good response or answer for us. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also just really appreciate uh, the compassion and empathy that you guys are always demonstrating toward everybody that is in this population and struggling. Um, I've said I have a large family here. And my large family has included people that have lived on the streets and so have some of the people that were dear friends of mine. And so, um, which is part of why I volunteer with that population still. Um, so I appreciate that. Thanks. I just have a quick question. Did you um, have a question about generational homelessness here locally? 
Yeah, Do we have any ideas about that? I don't. Uh, I couldn't give you the exact data. We know that some. We know that some. Uh, there are, are there are there are adults now, but they're in their 30s or 20s, and they're they grew up on. They're born in the green belts, and they grew up on the street. Um, and we know that their parents, same thing. So uh, we know they exist. I just don't know the percentage. Well, I too appreciate all the work that you do. Thanks for a really um, robust report. And with that, we will, if there's no further questions, we'll move on to council reports. And Councilmember Castellano, we'll start with you. Okay, um, pretty quick. Let's see, I had breakfast at Fire Station 3. Um, I attended Friday Night Market, Arts Alive, the Kinetic Sculpture Race. Um, the harbor two by two meeting. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot going on with the harbor. Um, won't get into it now. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, and Eureka Main Street meeting, uh, where there was a presentation on the community organizations active in disaster um, by Nick Baum Crawford. Thank you, Councilmember Contreras Deloach. Um, mine is very brief. This is, the I think, the first I've ever really not had a meeting or anything that I was doing. So other than um, talking with a meeting with staff about various things, um, and then I've been in Florida and D.C. for a week, and so I really have nothing to report. Thank you. Councilmember Moulton? Thank you. I have no travel to report. Um, I, too, went to the Kinetic Grand Championship and the Forest Moon Festival. Um, got lots of tourists coming around, uh, Old Town kicking it oh, it was really fun um and then i uh, went to the two by two meeting with eureka city schools uh talked a lot about sharing facilities between city schools and the city a good reminder that they are two separate entities that own different buildings uh but we cooperate so that we can do things like summer programming and town halls in the schools or hoopsters um and that they can use uh city facilities as well um, got, saw some really great early literacy numbers that are just improving uh, just consistently with their hard work over there. And early literacy is, of course, a really great predictor of um, later lifetime success and, uh, you know, decreased bad outcomes like ending up homeless. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bauer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> had an RCEA meeting. Uh, county city two by two meeting lots of talk about roads and infrastructure and uh, lots of friendly banter there um, Friday night market was amazing I'm sure I think everybody was probably there everybody in the in the city was there too it was it was wild uh, saw the kinetics the sculptures uh, entering exiting the water super fun and I uh, attended a, a student presentation at Eureka High today to talk about um, the impact of sugar uh, consumption on our on our kids and the possibility of some kind of um, tax measure, um, which they um, did some great research on, and um, I'm sure we'll be hearing from them soon. So that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for engaging with our kids. I love that. Um, Council Member Fernandez. Thank you. Uh, there was no Redwood Region Economic Development Committee meeting uh, this last month because of the holiday. Uh, we did meet with the Harbor Commission, discuss the much needed dredging that needs to happen and the repaste of the pilings at the dock, uh, where we received a grant and are hopeful to have the work done before the winter season. Uh, yeah, I think you covered everything in the school board <laughs> meeting there that we had. Uh, Council Member Moulton, uh, they're currently awaiting a lot light adjustment as they continue to prepare for the transfer of the Jacobs property. And then like everyone else here uh, over the holiday weekend and then even this last weekend, there was just so much uh, attended uh, Eureka City Schools Community Schools Mixer. Uh, they're doing great work. Uh, you could tell by the outreach uh, that they've done with the turnout of community organizations and leaders that they had there. Uh, I as well, thankfully, had the opportunity to participate in Lemonade Day and I was able to tour a few different booths. Uh, you know, not 
if you're not familiar with it, it's an opportunity for the youth to learn business skills and resource management. The younger ones I got to visit, uh, probably about five, six, maybe seven years of age, they were raising money to buy a Nintendo Switch. Uh, one of the older ones was uh, was raising money because they recently had their bike stolen, unfortunately. Uh, so various reasons, and uh, they did. Uh, at least the younger ones did commit to donate 10% of their funds to a charity of their choice, one of them being AHA, the other being uh, Food for People. And then, yeah, Friday Night Market, always grateful for the event organizers there, and then uh, had the opportunity to attend a queer prom on Saturday as a chaperone. So, and, you know, with the end of my report, the next time I see you all, I'm going to be 40. So, wow. thank you. <laughs> thank you. You know what I wanted to share is about that lemonade day, about the bicycle. What was really neat about that is there was a younger sister, and that younger sister just dedicated all her time and all the profits to the older sister's bike. So she sat out there all day to support her sister, and I thought that was so sweet. With that positive message, we're adjourned. <laughs>